Mr. Lewandowski to stop the special counsel's investigation into the president and his campaign. As the report detailed, Mr. Dearborn was enlisted as part of that effort as well. Mr. Porter has other critical evidence regarding obstruction. As our hearings with the special counsel and other outside experts established, anyone else involved in these episodes of obstruction would have been charged with a crime. Anyone else. Let that sink in. The president knows this, and the White House is intent on preventing the American people from hearing the details. So it is no surprise that the White House blocked two of our witnesses, Mr. Porter and Mr. Dearborn, from showing up at all today. On behalf of the president, the White House and the Department of Justice are advocating, are advancing the same spurious legal doctrine they did when this committee called on the most important obstruction witness to testify, former White House counsel Don McGahn. They claim Porter and Dearborn, like McGahn, are absolutely immune from testifying before Congress. There is no such thing. The only court ever to consider this purported absolute immunity doctrine totally rejected it. That is why we have gone to court in the McGahn case to set it aside. What is happening today is more troubling than McGahn's failure to appear, because even if we apply DOJ's own made-up rules of absolute immunity, I question how Mr. Dearborn fits under those rules. According to DOJ opinions, absolute immunity applies to, quote, the president's immediate advisors who serve as the president's alter ego, close quote. To extend this already dubious doctrine to someone like Mr. Dearborn, who is far more removed from the president than McGahn, is a dangerous new stretch. I think we should call this what it is, an absolute cover-up by the White House. Mr. Lewandowski is here and has vital information about presidential obstruction of justice. The White House wants to limit our and your ability to hear it all. Mr. Lewandowski was called alone, one-on-one, -on -one, into the Oval Office on June 12th on June 19, 2017, and again on July 19, 2017, and the president did something I find startling. He dictated the speech to Mr. Lewandowski, a speech not for Mr. Lewandowski, but for Attorney General Sessions to deliver, then Attorney General Sessions. He secretly told Mr. Lewandowski to put the following words in the AG's mouth, quote, I am going to meet with the special prosecutor to explain this is very unfair and let the special prosecutor move forward with investigating election meddling for future elections so that nothing can happen in future elections. That quote is from volume two, page 91 of the Mueller report. As the Mueller report found, limiting the investigation to future elections would have cut off the investigation of any past conduct and struck at the heart of the special counsel's mandate. It would have ended the investigation of the president's conduct. The evidence found by the special counsel meant all the elements of obstruction of justice. Mr. Lewandowski was nervous about this demand from his former boss, as he should have been. It raised serious questions about criminal conduct. He was recused, forbidden from doing anything regarding the Mueller investigation. He was certainly not allowed to curtail it. So Mr. Lewandowski tried to surreptitiously meet with the AG, and that failed, he tried to pass the buck to Mr. Dearborn. Mr. Lewandowski gave Mr. Dearborn the script that had been dictated by the president, all while telling the president that he would follow through on the president's orders. So that is what we want to learn, try to learn more about today. As we learned with Special Counsel Mueller, witness testimony is critical to any investigation. But the White House does not want us or the American people to hear this story in full. Late yesterday, the White House sent us a letter claiming that Mr. Lewandowski's conversations with the president, quote, are protected from disclosure by executive branch confidentiality interests, close quote. They say he may testify about presidential communications that are already disclosed in the Mueller report, but no more. They make that claim despite the fact that Mr. Lewandowski was at all times a private political operative, apparently was not offering advice of any kind, the usual prerequisite for executive privilege, and was enlisted for apparent wrongdoing. No court has ever said that the president is entitled to confidentiality under these circumstances. Indeed, the Department of Justice has said executive privilege should not be invoked to conceal evidence of wrongdoing on the part of executive officers. The White House is advancing a new and dangerous theory, the crony privilege. It makes absolute immunity look good by comparison. Where are the limits? This is a cover-up, plain and simple. If it were to prevail, especially while the Judiciary Committee is considering whether to recommend articles of impeachment, 
It would upend the separation of powers as envisioned by our founders. And today's cover-up is part of a pattern of the White House blocking Congress. The president announced his desire to, quote, fight all the subpoenas, unquote. The White House's obstruction of Congress ranges across nearly every committee and virtually every investigation of the administration, whether related to children in cages, botched security clearances, or their failure to defend the country from ongoing attacks by a foreign adversary. Well, Mr. Lewandowski, you are here under subpoena. That means you are required to answer our questions, all our questions, completely and truthfully. Our investigation also extends beyond the four corners of the Mueller report. We are looking at corruption and abuse of power more broadly, so we will inquire about other subjects as well. We will not be daunted by the cover-up. We intend to secure accountability for any wrongdoing, because no one is above the law, not even the President of the United States. I now recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for introducing uh, this hearing, which is now, as you said, under the new rules. You know, it's sort of the old school, the old rules of the new rules, the new rules of the old rules. These were new rules. These were rules that were here all along. And yet, here we go again. We're going to say that they're new because we like the packaging. I've never seen a majority so amazed with packaging in all my life. You know why? Because they can't sell what's inside. They can't sell the product. So they just keep packaging it differently. You know, I think we should call, I agree with my chairman, I think we should call this for what it is. It's just another simple override hearing. In fact, no, I think it's actually become this. It has become, let's read the Mueller report for audiobook. That's what we've become. We had Mr. Mueller here. Had a long day of it. Judging by all accounts, it didn't go real well for the purpose of what you've proclaimed for over nine months and almost two years that there's impeachable offenses, as my chairman has said, clearly in the Mueller report. But here's the problem. 17 of the members of the Judiciary Committee have said that they think the president ought to be impeached. So why are we still investigating it? 17, you get some more. The problem is you don't have the votes. You don't have the numbers, and even if you got it out of this committee, you don't have it on the floor. That's your problem. So the thing that we're going to do is, is we're going to drag this committee through oversight hearings, talking about things that have been talked about at nauseum, at nauseum, at nauseum. We're going to talk about it. We're going to put filters up. We're going to say what it really is or really is not. While in all the things, we're going to try to imply that this president shouldn't be president. You know, it is really interesting to me that we just said, just heard just a moment ago that it was said that these made-up rules at DOJ. Well, it's interesting that now they're made-up rules. They wasn't made-up rules when Obama administration used them. Were they made-up rules then? Just asking for a friend. You know, this is amazing. As we come into this situation, the, the chairman also said that while we're doing this and, and stopping committees from searching into products like the, the immigration issue and foreign influence, I just want to remind everybody here watching and everybody here to, to see the, the show today and also to remind the majority that they have complete jurisdiction over immigration. We have complete and total jurisdiction over immigration for the most part. All we have to do is if you want to fix the border, put a bill up. You don't want to do that. You like this. You like having the press here. You like the cameras. Because it makes it appear like something's happening that's not. But the real, real thing that's coming out starting, the American people are starting to get it. They're starting to get it that if you're just howling at the wind, you're not doing anything. You're making them think you are, but you're not. So don't tell me, don't bring to me immigration anymore that you want to deal with it. You just want to bring administration officials in here and yell at them because what you don't like is happening. And I agree, we need to fix it. Bring us a bill, bring my bill, bring your bill, but do something about it. Quit talking about it, foreign influence. The only real thing we all agree on in the Mueller report was foreign influence from Russia, but yet, where's the bill? Where's the bill? Where's Waldo? Where's the bill? We don't do anything about it. We like to talk about it because we think it makes the president look bad. Because that's the implication we've been giving for two years. Unfortunately, we also don't really want information in this committee either. If we did, we'd work like the Intel Committee had done. You know, we've been, had that issue before. They'd have to actually work with witnesses to get them to come in. Mr. Lindowski, I believe, said he'd come without a subpoena, but yet we subpoenaed him anyway. Because it looks, oh, as, my, as, as I was told earlier this year, from the chairman's perspective, a subpoena is a start of a dialogue. Not according to Black's Law Dictionary, but who cares? We're just the Judiciary Committee. This is the problem we're having. This committee does not want to interview Don McGahn behind closed doors. They want him in front of everybody. 
They want to do this out front. They don't try to actually get information. That's what real oversight is. Real oversight is trying to get information. But we don't do that. I understand it's tough making a promise and not keeping it. I understand. All of us in this room can relate to a time when we kept, made a promise and we couldn't keep it. My majority made a promise. We'll impeach him. We'll investigate him. For most of them, it happened in November 2016 because they couldn't believe that Donald Trump won. And they still can't get over it today. So what do we do? We have public hearings, lots of flashbulbs, embarrassing the president, not gathering facts, not investigating, not doing oversight. This is certainly not being fair, but we like to issue subpoenas. We're setting a world record at that. 40 times faster than the previous chairman. But we don't want any answers because we're not willing to engage in dialogue to get information from folks. And you know how I really don't, I, I believe that this is more just wanting to get it here is because it's not like Mr. Lewandowski has had silent on this issue. He's testified before Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. He's testified before House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. And now he's also voluntarily testified for the special counsel, by the way, Mr. Mueller. And we've had access to all of his summaries of his, of his testimony. This is not new. But yet it is new because it's another time to rehash an old story. You know, this is the fall. This is when the, the, the uh, ABC and NBC and all, the, all the, the broadcast folks, they bring out their new shows. This isn't the summer rerun season. We should get into something new, but I just want to show you one last thing before I turn it back over and, you know, we'll get the popcorn and the show going. The Judiciary Committee is the Judiciary Committee for a reason. It's because we oversee the court system. And for any person who has actually been here, and actually an attorney in this room who's actually appeared before a judge, a judge is pretty stickler for rules. And I just want to point out something. It may be trivial, and I know some will laugh and some won't care, but for some of us it does matter. The subpoena today for Mr. Lewandowski and the others, said 10 a.m. this morning. This just shows you how impulsive and poorly designed this entire sort of faux impeachment charade we're doing. The subpoena is not even properly. The subpoenas were here for all three to compel them at 10 o'clock this morning, but today's hearing's at 1, not 10. The witnesses lack appropriate notice for the hearing today. That's a simple, basic subpoena issue. But we're the Judiciary Committee. I can understand this, and no offense, natural resources, I can understand if they get it wrong. Or transportation. I don't understand how judiciary gets this wrong. The chairman wants to hold people in contempt for not showing up. Try to enforce this in court. Because there's no extra letter. There's no clarification of time. And when I was given a subpoena for my client to appear in court, what time do you appear in court? Whenever you feel like it? No, at the time it says. Unless the court or the officer giving the subpoena says differently. The chairman's only offer for success here is to issue, well, we could do this, I guess, because we've wasted enough time on other things. We reissue new subpoenas with a new date, new time, and hold a new hearing. There's probably a date somewhere in October we haven't filled up with this mess somewhere. So with this, here we go. Mr. Chairman, there's so much that we could actually do together. There's so much. But as long as we don't have time, we'll continue with rerun season. Popcorn still tastes good. I don't know why we do this. Except maybe we just have maybe a deficiency of flashbulbs. I don't know. Because we just like the show. And the show is going to get even more as it goes today. Because the new rules are in effect. Oh, wait, they're not new. They're just old. But we're applying them today because we want it to look better. And I have one more of those we'll talk about later uh, when we get to some other questions later. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Collins. I will now introduce today's witness. Corey Lewandowski is a political consultant and commentator. He previously served as the first campaign manager for Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Mr. Lewandowski received a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Massachusetts and a master's degree in political science from American University. He also attended the Naval War College. Former White House Deputy Chief of Staff Rick Dearborn and former White House Staff Secretary Robert Porter have refused to appear today despite duly issued subpoenas from this committee. As I discussed in my opening statement, I strongly disagree with the White House's assertion of absolute immunity as to Mr. Dearborn and Mr. Porter. We are considering all available options to enforce these subpoenas. We welcome Mr. Lewandowski and we thank him for participating in today's hearing. Now, if you please rise, I will begin by swearing you in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, 
witnesses. I hope you got it. Let the record show that the witness is answered in the affirmative. Thank you, and please be seated. Please note that your written statement will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, there's a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. Ms. Lewandowski, you may begin. Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, and members of the committee, good afternoon. I'd like to start off by expressing my hope that today's hearing will be productive in revealing the truth, both to the committee and to the American people. For the record, and as you likely know, I have already testified before Congress on three separate occasions. I sat at length with the staff of the Special Counsel's Office. There, too, my time and answers were given freely and without hesitation. I think in one form or another, I have already answered questions for well over 20 hours. So now here I am before the House Judiciary Committee to answer the same questions again. Just last week, this committee, over the objections of the minority, unilaterally changed the rules to make this an impeachment proceeding, which is very unfair. However, in the spirit of cooperation, I am prepared to move forward today. I'd like to start by recounting the events that brought us to this point. My story of joining the Trump campaign, working through a historic election, and continuing to have the privilege to be part of the greatest political movement in our nation's history. I present this summary in the interest of truth and transparency to the American people, the very same reason and rationale that this committee offers as the basis for today's hearing. Growing up in a blue-collar, single-parent family in Lowell, Massachusetts, I learned the value of hard work. And that work ethic helped me to put myself through both college and graduate school, prior to becoming a congressional staffer and ultimately a certified peace officer in the state of New Hampshire. However, the world of politics was always a passion. And in January of 2015, Donald J. Trump, then a private citizen, hired me to help him explore a possible run for the presidency. It was an honor and a privilege to play a small part of such a historic campaign. The campaign started as a small group of individuals helping Mr. Trump to make the decision in June of 2015 to ride down the golden escalator and seek the Republican nomination for presidency of the United States. For more than a year, I served as campaign manager to then-candidate Trump in his historic campaign, where I led a lean and dedicated operation that succeeded in helping him capture the Republican nomination. My job was simple, provide Mr. Trump with my best advice, spend his money like it was my own, and give him the support he needed to win. I also set long-term long -term objectives and managed day-to-day -day decisions. I had the privilege, and it was a privilege, of helping transform the Trump campaign from a dedicated but small makeshift organization to a historical and unprecedented political juggernaut. And I am proud to say Mr. Trump won 38 primaries and caucuses and received more votes than any candidate in the history of the Republican Party, all while being outspent most of the way. The historic campaign helped Mr. Trump secure the Republican nomination and ultimately the presidency of the United States. However, since Election Day, whether it was bad actors at the FBI and the intelligence community or lies coming from members of the current House majority that there was evidence of collusion, the American people continue to be sold a false narrative with the purpose of undermining the legitimacy of the 2016 election results. But no matter the size, campaigns are not always the most efficient organizations. And while you run in single congressional districts, just imagine what it's like to lead a national campaign that spans all 50 states of the union. During my time as campaign manager, there were competing interests for the candidate's time and a sea of ideas, some laudable, some sound, a few not so much, many of which were dismissed out of hand. Others were passed on to staffers to be handled. I also received hundreds of thousands of emails, some days with as many as 1,000 emails. And unlike Hillary Clinton, I don't think I ever deleted any of those. Many of them were responded to with either one-word answers or forwarded to other staffers for additional follow-up. But throughout it all, and to the best of my recollection, I don't ever recall having any conversations with foreign entities, let alone any who were offering to help to manipulate the outcome of an election. As I've said publicly many times, anyone who attempted to illegally impact the outcome of an election should spend the rest of their life in jail. And let me stress this fact. During the 2016 election cycle, Mr. Trump held no elected position. He was not a government official. Rather, the Obama-Biden administration and the intelligence community, overseen by James Clapper, Jim Comey, and John Brennan, 
had the responsibility to the American people to ensure the integrity of the 2016 election. I will leave it to this committee and the American public to decide how successful or not they were in doing their jobs. Regardless, as the special counsel determined, there was no conspiracy or collusion between the Trump campaign and any foreign governments, either on my watch or afterwards. Not surprisingly, after the Mueller report was made public, interest in the fake Russia collusion narrative has fallen apart. In conclusion, and it's sad to say, this country has spent over three years and 40 million taxpayer dollars on these investigations, and it's now clear that the investigation was populated by many Trump haters who had their own agenda to take down a duly elected president of the United States. As for actual collusion or conspiracy, there was none. What there has been, however, is harassment of this president from the day he won the election. We as a nation would be better served if elected officials like yourself concentrated your efforts to combat the true crises facing our country, as opposed to going down rabbit holes like this hearing. Instead of focusing on petty and personal politics, the committee focused on solving the challenges of this generation. Imagine how many people we could help, or how many lives we could save. As I stated earlier, I have voluntarily appeared in front of Congress on three separate occasions and spoken to members of the Special Counsel's Office for multiple hours. I will continue to be forthright, forthright and cooperative, and I will be as sincere in my answers as this committee is in its questions. Thank you for your testimony. We will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions. At the completion of the members' questions, Pursuant to the Chairman's September 12, 2019 Resolution for Investigative Procedures, pursuant to a notice, this will be followed by one hour of staff questioning, equally divided by the majority and the minority. I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Mr. Lewandowski, we received a letter from the White House just yesterday that they will not let you answer any questions beyond what you told the Special Counsel and was publicly released. The White House's instruction to you is based on a bogus claim of executive privilege, even though you did not work a single day for the administration, let alone in the executive branch. My colleagues are going to get into the specific events in detail, but I'm especially troubled by the President's attempt to obstruct Congress's investigation and prevent the American people from learning the truth about what he's done, and I want to ask you questions relevant to that issue. Mr. Lewandowski, is it correct that as reported in the Mueller report on June 19, 2017, you met alone in the Oval Office with the President? I said, is, is, is there a book and page number you can reference me to, please? I don't have a copy of the report in front of me. Volume 2, page 90. But I, I simply ask you, is it correct that as reported in the Mueller report on June 19, 2017, you met alone in the Oval Office with the President? Could you read the exact language of the report, sir? I don't have it available to me. I don't think I need to do that, and I have limited time. Did you meet alone with the president on that date? Congressman, I'd like you to refresh my memory by providing a copy of the report so I can follow page, along. Hey, you don't have a copy with you? I don't have a copy of the report, Congressman. Mr. Chairman, I request uh, that the clock be stopped while this uh, charade is sorted out. I'm sorry, Congressman, what page was it? The clock should have been stopped and should remain stopped. Page, not, page 90, volume 2. Okay, and which paragraph, sir? I don't have it in front of me. I'd like a reference, sir, so I can follow along on what you're asking. Do you not have an independent recollection of whether you met with the President on that date? Congressman, I'm just trying to find in the Mueller report where it states that. Well, you have it in front of you. I gave you the, pres the, the page number. Yeah, what, where on page 90 is it, sir? Mr. Chairman, you got to start the clock. Miss, no, I don't have to start the clock when he's filibustering. Bottom of page 90. Well, filibustering is a different Bottom issue. Of That's page across the hall in the Bottom Senate. Of this is actual questions being done now. Mr. Chairman, point of parliamentary inquiry. inquiry, Mr. Chairman. That's not me. The gentleman will state his point of parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Chairman, is it appropriate for a witness to refuse to answer a question and instead demand that we reference and point him to the... I'd ask that that Mueller report be closed and the witness be directed to answer the question. No, well, the answer is it's not appropriate, but it's on the bottom two lines of that page. Point of 
Point of order, uh, when will the clock start, Mr. Chairman? Once the questions asked, Mr. Chairman, the clock should start. Right under overview, second line. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman, the witness. Point of order. The witness has the time and will answer. Point of order is a, a question. The point witness of order will answer overrides the question. that. A point of order overrides that, Mr. Chairman, and you know that. The gentleman will state his point of order. Point of order is once the question has been asked and referenced properly to the witness to answer the question, the clock should start. It cannot be held while you and your counsel go over notes. The gentleman is correct. The, ge the clock will start. And the, qu and the witness will answer the question without further delay. Yes, I see that in the report. Thank you. During that meeting, did you tell the special counsel that the president, quote, asked you to deliver a message to Sessions, who was then the Attorney General of the United States? Page 91. I ask you a question, sir. I'm, I'm looking for that reference on page 91, Congressman. Do you not have an independent recollection? No, I'm looking. Mr. You Congressman, I'm trying to uh, adhere to the White House's request. I answer questions that are provided in the Mueller report only. So I'm trying to reference that report directly about your question, Congressman. Were you a White House employee at that time? No, Congressman. And if, um, did you have, okay. Uh, you did not hold any position in the government whatsoever, did you? Correct. Now, sitting behind you are counsel for the White House, correct? That's my understanding. You understand those lawyers actually work for the president at the White House? I believe that's accurate. Nevertheless, the president's lawyers have told you not to answer any question by this committee other than what has already been disclosed in the special counsel's report. Is that correct? Congressman, I'd have to read from the letter that the White House provided the committee if that would help clarify. Would you like me to do that, Congressman? No, I'd like you to answer the question. Have you been directed... Congressman, uh, I've never spoken to any members of the White House Counsel's Office other than saying hello about 15 seconds ago. But you were directed by letter. Congressman, I was provided a letter that I believe this committee was assigned. It says, as, as explained below, Mr. Lewandowski's conversation with the President and with senior advisors to the President are protected from disclosure by okay. long-settled long principles so protecting the, uh, executive I'll branch confidentiality interests, and as a result, the White House is directing Mr. Lewandowski not to provide information about such communications beyond yes. the information will provided will take, in the portions of the report. We'll take that as a yes. Never the, um, and the basis for their direction is a claim of executive privilege. Is that correct? I can read it again, Congressman. The answer is you don't, you're not answering the question. We've already established that you were never employed by the White House or the executive branch. That is correct. I have never been employed by the executive branch. Sir, did you ask the White House counsels to be here? Congressman, as I just reiterated, I've never spoken to anyone in the White the House counsel's office. The answer is no. Was it your idea for you not to answer questions based on a claim of executive privilege? I can reiterate I didn't ask. I've never had a conversation with someone from the White House counsel's office so regarding so this matter. Your, so it was your idea not to answer I have questions? never had a conversation with someone from the White House Counsel's was Office Was it your idea not to answer these questions on the basis of executive privilege, yes or no? Congressman, I can only go by the letter that was provided. It was not my idea to provide this letter. Not your idea. Did you ever suggest to the President or anyone else that you thought your communications with him were official White House communications? Congressman, the White House has directed not, I not disclose the substance of any discussions with the President or his advisors to protect executive branch confidentiality. And I recognize this is not my privilege but I am respecting the White House's decision. Let me ask you some questions about your relationship with the President after he assumed office. How many times has the President asked you to meet him in the White House? The White House is directed not to disclose the substance of How any discussions. How many times did you meet with the President alone in the White House in 2017? I don't know the answer to that. How many times did he direct you to deliver a message to a member of his cabinet? The White House has directed I not disclose the substance of any discussions did with the ever, President. Did, did he ever discuss with you any concerns that he may have committed a criminal offense? The White House has directed not disclose the substance of Very any good. discussions with the President or his advisors to so protect you, executive so branch confidentiality. All right, I recognize this is Chairman, not my privilege. So Mr. So Chairman, I make a point of order. Pursuant to Clause 2J2A of Rule 11, that the gentleman is out of order, he has exceeded the time limit under the five-minute rule. I will enforce the time, the time limit under the five-minute rule. I challenge the ruling I am of the very, chair. I challenge the ruling of the chair. The, chair the, cha the ruling of the chair is challenged. All those in favor of overriding the rule of the chair will say aye. aye. Opposed, no. 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 Roll call. Those have it. Roll call is asked. The clerk will call. Where's the clerk? No, we can make this a lot easier, Jerry. We can. I mean, this the clerk will call the roll.
All right, so the fireworks have already started. The hearing really just about 10 minutes into it. First questioning and um, Corey Lewandowski uh, putting up some points right there for a lot of uh, President Trump's staff and uh, people that are watching for the Republicans here. But you could see House Democrats very agitated from the beginning here. So let's see how this all unfolds. We'll be back. More news now up next. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen. No. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass. Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Richmond. Mr. Jeffries. No. Mr. Jeffries votes no. Mr. Cicilline. No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell. No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings. No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia. No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagus. No. Mr. Nagus votes no. Ms. McBath. Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Mukarsal Powell? Ms. Escobar? Mr. Collins? Aye. Mr. Collins votes aye. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Buck? Mr. Radcliffe? Mr. Radcliffe votes yes. Ms. Roby? Mr. Gates? Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Ms. Lesko. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Stubbe. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Has everyone voted who wishes to vote? Cl Madam Clerk? Mr. Buck, you are not recorded. Yes. Mr. Buck votes yes. Is anyone else? Clerk will report. Welcome back, everyone, here to News Now, taking a uh, listen at this uh, big-time obstruction of justice hearing from the House Democrats. Let's listen in here. They were just doing a, uh, a vote there on uh, a possible delay there with the uh, House Democrats. Let's listen in now. White House counsel sitting behind you are preventing you from answering these very basic questions that go to the heart of the president's conduct we are investigating. Mr. Chairman, I have a motion. Not o Mr. Chairman, not I have only a motion. You will wait for your motion until I finish this. Point of order, then. Not, not only Point will of order has got to be recognized. Not in the middle of... Yes, it does. No. The motion is to... Since the chairman is not following the House rules, I move to adjourn. Motion is to adjourn. A motion Point to of adjourn. parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Motion to adjourn. If the not. Republicans on this committee are successful in this motion to adjourn, does that mean there will be no hearing and the American people will not hear from Mr. Lewandowski about his efforts to obstruct justice? Yes, that's exactly what it okay. means. That's what it also could read, they could read the three times motion. the previous already done it. I have a point of parliamentary inquiry. The motion is not debatable. As many as are in favor of the motion to adjourn. I have a motion of parliamentary as inquiry. As many are in favor. So Mr. Cicilline gets recognized for his inquiry, but I don't get recognized for debatable. As many as are in favor of the motion to adjourn say aye. Opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Roll call. We will, roll, call. roll call is requested. The question is on the motion to adjourn. All right, so another roll call has been requested. This one, uh, the Republicans want to adjourn, and uh, obviously Democrats uh, do not want to, so they're going to do another roll call here. And uh, this is, I mean, the Democrats have the majority here in this hearing, so... This will likely not be adjourned. Let's listen in. Cicilline? No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu? Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin? No. 
Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Neguse? Mr. Neguse votes no. Ms. McBath? Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Es Ms. Mukarsal Powell? Ms. Escobar? Mr. Collins? Mr. Collins votes aye. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes aye. Mr. Buck? Mr. Radcliffe? Mr. Radcliffe votes yes. Ms. Roby? Mr. Gates? Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes aye. Ms. Lesko? Aye. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler? Mr. Klein? Aye. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong? Yes. Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Stubbe? Yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Mr. Chairman, there are 12 ayes and 19 noes. The motion to adjourn is not adopted. And I will finish what I was saying. I am very troubled that the White House counsel sitting behind you are preventing you from answering these very basic questions that go to the heart of the President's conduct we are investigating. Not only are you not a government employee, but these questions are about the President's efforts to interfere with a criminal investigation of himself and have nothing to do with official government business. This is clearly just part of the President's continued attempt to cover up his actions. He is obstructing our congressional investigation by preventing you from telling the American people the truth about his misconduct. He will not succeed, and we will not be deterred. And now recognize the uh, gentleman from Georgia for his opening, for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this past few minutes was totally avoidable and also very frustrating in the sense that it is also now raised from our perspective a question of the privilege of the rules of the House, which could be discussed on the floor and probably will be, and possibly just the blatant running over of House rules. Um, my concern is ethics uh, violations as well. This has got to be run in a different way. So at this point, uh, Mr. Lindowski, you have testified before Congress multiple times over the past couple of years, correct? Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong. You've already testified twi twice before the House Intel Committee, correct? Yes. How long was those sessions? Uh, I think the first session was about seven hours, and the second session was maybe four hours. You've also testified before Senate Intel, correct? Yes. About how long was that? Uh, it was about eight hours. Okay. You've also testified before the uh, Special Counsel's Office, correct? Yes. How many times? Uh, two separate occasions. And for about how long on that? Uh, probably 15 to 16 hours. Okay. And... and those were voluntarily, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So there was really, and you were agreed to come here voluntarily as well, correct, today? I did. There was no need for a, for a basically a flawed subpoena to be issued to you, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and I want to note that our staff and many of our members have read the full FBI summary of your testimony because everyone in this committee has access to your special counsel interview summary for months. Um, have you had the opportunity to review the FBI summaries in preparation for today? No, sir. Uh, which goes to the point out why he won't be able to remember so many details outside of what is specifically written in the Mueller report, and that's something he needs to be made aware of. Were you given any guidelines by the Democrats on the topics or subjects of your questions today? Not to the best of my recollection. Yeah, because that, you know, that is a problem that we seem to have here is basically what we'll say is overbroad uh, subpoenas around here. Um, there's, I mean, we could have talked today about your favorite football team. I'm not sure. Patriots. Patriots. So you're pretty happy right now, right? Tom's a winner. Again, the problem we have here is we don't uh, follow procedure because if it gets in the way of a good story, we don't like it around here. So we'll do whatever we want, including broke house rules, to do that as, as we go forward. Um, in any of the times that you've uh, had today, especially not being questioned, you have stated in your opening statement that you plan to answer as best you possibly can. Is that correct? Yes, sir. But you also, at a certain point in time, realized that being having testified so many times in these various issues that we have, that there are certain things... You know, is, does that concern you having to keep coming back and back again 
um, without having proper reference if somebody was to, if, as you said earlier, I want to know the reference in which you're speaking to. Would that be a problem to you? Well, sir, I think my memory, obviously, to events which transpired more than two years ago was clearer uh, the first time I testified to it because it was a year and a half ago on many occasions or longer. So if I can have a specific reference to something, I'd be happy to have that. So it's not and make sure that you give an accurate response, seeing how you've also already testified on these issues many times before, correct? Yes, sir. So to imply otherwise is basically, you know, in many ways taking a shot at your uh, testimony here, correct? It is. Okay. When you worked on the Trump campaign, and you said this earlier, I just want it to be stated again because we've had these hearings here in the, the Judiciary Committee, it didn't seem to take, but we'll try again. Did you engage in collusion, coordination, or conspiracy with the Russians? Never. Did you observe anyone else doing that? No, sir. Okay. When we look at what's going on here today, I think the concern that we have, and many of us on this side, is we have a narrative that's failed. The failed narrative is continued. You're being asked to come in here and do something that you've done many times over that this whole committee has seen exactly what you're looking for. If you're following the premise of what the chairman says that the majority is looking for, is that they're finding a reason to try and impeach the president. I've already said they, they, they have found, 17 of them at least have publicly said they found a reason which really don't have to, you know, any further, but they can't get the more on the floor to do this. So this is dragging this out. So Mr. Lewandowski, I would encourage you, you know, to answer the questions fully as you said you would do. You voluntarily come here, even though that we decided to throw a, a flawed subpoena at you um, and the others as well. And I think as we go forward here, we'll see how this uh, actually moves forward. But this is concerning to me, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna take this for the, for the moment. It's okay to try and get your stuff out. It's okay to be frustrated, but it's also not okay to overrun house rules. The five minute rule is a house rule. It's not a committee rule, and it's not for upper interpretation by the chairman, whatever he feels like. It wouldn't be if I was a chairman or you're the chairman. That's not debatable. And you may not have got your last question in, but we've already discussed, and we're going to have a lot more discussion here in a little while on staff questioning, but there's, there's plenty of time to get that last little question that you didn't get asked to somebody else. But is it worth breaking the House rules? And I know some in the audience don't care, and some of the majority don't care. But at the end of the day, you're accusing a president of very high issues that we got to look at. You're accusing him and dragging it through in this committee for eight months we're doing this. So I think following procedures. And welcome back everyone here to News and Now. We are taking a listen in to one of the most in-demand hearings of this week, maybe even the month here as House Democrats trying to ramp up pressure for impeachment. They brought in former President Trump's campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski. Lewandowski, who you see there on uh, the screen right there, and boy, has it already been fireworks from the get-go. Let's continue to listen a little bit more. This one just getting started here on News Now. To deliver that message to Attorney General Sessions, the president could have just picked up the phone and called the Attorney General. The president also had a full staff of executive employees right down the hall. So this made me wonder, the president thought what he was doing was legal. Why didn't he just pick up the phone and call the Attorney General Sessions, or why not ask any member of his staff who worked right down the hall to deliver a message? It is clear to me that the reason he went to you, Mr. Leandowski, is because everyone said no. So I want to ask you about that. Two days before meeting you, the president had called White House Counsel McGahn at home on a Saturday to fire the special counsel saying, and you can see that on the screen, Mueller has to go. Call me back when you do it. Plain and simple. But McGahn refused. When the president asked you to deliver that message, did he, the president, tell you that two days before your meeting, his White House counsel had refused to fire the special counsel? Volume 1186 is where you find that language. Volume two, volume two. When the president asked you, did you hear the question? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, Congressman? When the president asked you to deliver that message, did he, the president, tell you that two days before your meeting, his White House counsel had refused to fire the special counsel? The, the White House has directed me that I not disclose the substance of any so conversations with the you president. You are not allowed advisors. to answer whether the president told you he called his counsel at home on Saturday to remove, on a Saturday, to remove the special counsel, and his counsel said no. The president had also personally called Sessions at home and asked him to unrecuse himself and oversee the special counsel's investigation, and Sessions said no. 
When the president asked you to deliver his message to Sessions, did the president tell you that Sessions had already said no? Volume 2, one, page 107. Again, Congresswoman, I recognize that the privilege is not mine, but I've been this asked by the White public, House to... Uh, I'm Congresswoman, I'd be happy to answer your question, or you can just have a conversation by yourself. But if you'd like to ask me a question, no, I'll be happy I, to I'm answer I'm going it. to continue. The reason is well, because... Well, then don't ask me a question if I'm you don't want to hear my answer. I'm my time. This is a House judiciary, not a House party. So if you ask me a question, give me the opportunity campaign, to answer your the question. The campaign the special counsel is investigating. I'd like my time restored, please, of his interruption. So he was a witness to the special counsel's investigation. For that reason, Sessions said publicly that federal law prohibited his involvement in the special counsel's investigation. Here's a quote from the report from volume two, pages 49 to 50, which is on the screen. You can read that. Yes or no? Did the president tell you that the attorney general was legally not allowed to take any part in the special counsel's investigation when he asked you to deliver him a note about that very investigation? Did the president tell you that? What you've just read is not on the screen, Congresswoman. You need to look at the screen. It is. Yes or no? Read the screen. You're welcome to read it, Congresswoman. Uh, you're welcome to be stalling, and I'm not going to stall. You either answer the question yes or no. Congressman, I'll take the same you, privileges that you've asked other members. tell you that nobody at the White House was supposed to even contact the Attorney General about the investigation? That you can answer yes or no. I will not disclose any conversations I've had with the President Congressman. Again, uh, you are obviously here to block any reasonable inquiry into the truth or not of this administration. The White House counsel, quote, shortly after Sessions announced his recusal, directed that Sessions should not be contacted about the special counsel investigation. Um, in fact, the White House counsel's internal notes state, no contact with Sessions and no communication serious about instruction. Can you read that? I just said it. Can you read that? Did you hear me? Yes. Is there a question? Yes. Did the president tell you his White House counsel told him no contact with Sessions because of serious concerns of obstruction when he asked you to deliver a message to Sessions? I am respecting the executive branch privilege of confidentiality, and I will recognize that this time. Let me just say that you knew, did you know the president was putting you at risk when he asked you to deliver a message to the attorney general? I want to be very clear. The president knew what he was doing was wrong because everyone else had already said no. He called his White House counsel to fire the special counsel. McGahn said no. He called the attorney general to ask him to unrecuse himself from the special counsel's investigation. Sessions said no. His White House counsel said there should be no contact with Sessions because of his recusal. So what does the president do? He calls you in to do what everyone else wouldn't do. He calls you in to do his dirty work in secret because he knew time, it was wrong. Time, well, we will expose the truth. Time, the president can hi time, hide behind you any longer. Uh, and you should be here to be telling the truth, the Mr. Lewandowski, the because the, time the truth the will set you free the and the American lady, people. The I yield back. The time of the gentlelady has expired. The witness may answer the question. I don't believe there was a question, Congressman. Very well. Yes, there was. Could you repeat the question? I didn't hear it. I'd be happy to repeat the it's question. It's just a rant. Can't repeat the question. I'll be happy to repeat the question. The gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from... Uh, did you know the attorney general the gen the gen recused? The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Shabbat, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewandowski, uh, thank you for appearing uh, this afternoon to testify before this uh, committee. Um, I understand that you've spent many hours testifying voluntarily uh, before Congress over the last few years. Isn't that correct? It is. And have you had to hire and retain counsel uh, to represent you for all the investigations that you've had to endure simply because you served as the president's campaign manager? Yes, sir. That's unfortunate because you didn't solicit or receive assistance from the Russians, did you? No, sir. Are you an agent working on behalf of the Russian government? No, sir. As a close friend and advisor of the president, you don't believe that the president is working on behalf of the Russians, do you? Absolutely not. And to your knowledge, there is no effort on the part of the president to intentionally obstruct justice, is there? No, sir. Thank you. And yet again, uh, coming here to tell this committee what we, Special Counsel Mueller and the American public, already know 
that President Trump did not collude with the Russians, nor did he obstruct justice. That's not to say that the Russians weren't trying to interfere and influence our 2016 presidential elections. It's clear that they were by sending fake texts and operating fake Facebook pages and holding fake rallies, all in an effort to try to influence the outcome of the election. Democrats want to ignore all of the real evidence of Russian interference and hold this fake impeachment because it happened under a different president's watch. This all happened under President Obama's watch, isn't that correct? Yes, sir. And it was the Obama administration that failed to protect us from the Russian interference and influence in our election. Isn't that also true? Yes. President Trump wasn't president. He wasn't the one that, that failed to protect the country. If anybody failed, it was the Obama administration. Is that right? Yes, it is. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. We're wasting valuable committee time engaging in this impeachment investigation. The fact of the matter is, one thing this committee could be doing is to question Inspector General Horowitz concerning the bias against the president at the origins of the Russian investigation. We could be questioning Horowitz about his recent report how then FBI Director Comey mishandled department memos. This committee has such a rich history, its jurisdiction over a whole lot of very significant things. We're spending our time on this fake impeachment, but we could be focused on something that really matters like immigration, asylum. We have hundreds of thousands of people that have entered our southern border. Generally, they're brought up either individually or in groups, caravans, usually oftentimes connected with cartels. Cartels make a lot of money when they come up here. They're told the magic words, come across the border. They say that they're in fear and come right into our country, and we put them on a, on a bus or on a plane, and they're sent to communities all across the country. That's something this committee should be working in a bipartisan manner to do something about. Opioids, we had about 70,000 Americans who lost their lives to opioids last year. That's something in the jurisdiction of this committee, yet we do virtually nothing about it in this committee. Balanced budget amendment, it's something I've introduced in this Congress. We've got a $22 trillion debt hanging over our head, yet we do nothing in this committee about attempting to actually pass something that would make us balance the budget every year, like all our states have to do. So finally, I, I just want to thank you again, Mr. Lewandowski, for appearing at today's hearing. Perhaps your testimony today will finally convince Democrats that there are much more important things that this committee could be spending our time on, rather than continuing to pursue this fake impeachment, a faux impeachment. The bottom line is they don't have the votes in the House to move forward, to, for the House to vote for this committee to open up an impeachment inquiry. They don't have the votes. Some of the Democrats want to vote for it. Some of the Democrats would vote against it, but they don't have the votes. So what they do is they spend valuable committee time that we could be spending on other important things on this fake faux impeachment. And it's a shame because this committee could be doing so much more on behalf of the American people. With that, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, point of parliamentary inquiry. Who, who states the point of parliament? The gentleman will state his point of parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Chairman, the witness just answered a long line of questions from the gentleman from Ohio about whether Donald Trump had colluded with the Russians and about the origins of the Mueller investigation and so on, but he never testified as to any of those things before Special Counsel Mueller. Can he now continue to invoke this White House rationale that he's confined to the four corners of the Mueller report when he's gone way beyond it in his responses to the questioning from the gentleman from Ohio? The, uh, regardless of whether he uh, went beyond the four corners of the Mueller report and the answers that he gave to the last, uh, uh, to the last questioner, regardless of that, and I'm glad to hear his, the he favors the Patriots, even though that's not in the Mueller report. But regardless of the long series of answers that he gave, uh, irrelevant, that weren't in the Mueller report, the claim of privilege made by the witness is improper for the reasons set forth in our letter today to the White House and to the witness's counsel. That said, I will take the claim of privilege under advisement. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry. 
the gentleman will state his parliamentary Did you actually inquiry. answer his parliamentary inquiry? Because it was a statement, not a parliamentary inquiry. You just sort of skipped on to executive privilege here. At least well, that acknowledge that it was not a, pre 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 uh, a parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman stated the parliamentary inquiry. He did uh, not. I, that was a statement. I answered his parliamentary inquiry. The, uh, general, the gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Leandowski, it's been made clear here you were not an employee and you admitted it at the White House. You had no W-2, you had no card, you had nothing. You were not an employee. And you were a policeman at one time. So you know something about the law and about following the law. Didn't you think it was a little strange that the president would sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and ask you to do something that you knew was against the law? Did that strike you as strange? I disagree with the premise of your question, Congressman. You weren't a policeman? I didn't, I didn't think the president asked me to do anything illegal. You didn't think it would have been illegal for you to ask Mr. Sessions to drop the investigation and to just go on to future presidents and omit everything with this president and go ali ali in free? We're going to start with the next one about colluding with Russia? You didn't think that was illegal to obstruct justice? Congressman, the president has asked me anything illegal. Obviously, you've never been a judge and won't be one. All these people asked you, they gave you dictation. He dictated to you a, a message to give sessions. Had you ever been a secretary for the president before and taken dictation or shorthand? Many times. Oh, we got your qualifications now. You were a secretary. Uh, could it, could, but he asked you outside of White House channels, and that's what Mueller wrote, that this was outside of White House channels. Could it have been he asked you to get the message to sessions because he thought you would do whatever he asked, even if it was illegal or immoral? Just like your former boss, Bob Ney, who said you were an implementer. News reports called you the president's, quote, enforcer. USA Today said Lewandowski's background is largely as a Trump guy, and not so much as a strategist, not a campaign manager, but as a right-hand man, a body man, and an enforcer. And Esquire went further and said the one-time campaign manager for Donald Trump has the traits of an enforcer and the conflict resolution skills to match. <clears throat> And you have have, you've, heard, you've even described yourself in your book, Let Trump Be Trump. You said, we were fine with whatever role the president wanted us to play. In Donald Trump's army, there were only loyal soldiers. There were no more loyal soldiers. Your previous boss, Bob Ney, was convicted of corruption and lying to authorities in the Jack Abraham scandal. You were fired from Americans for Prosperity after being accused of fraud, voter fraud. You are now involved in this. Either you were willing to break the law for politics and Mr. Trump, or you're some kind of a Forrest Gump relating to corruption. So maybe let me ask you this. Did the president pick you as enforcer? He thought you would play whatever role he wanted because it was illegal? Is that possibly why he chose you to take this message to Sessions? That'd be a question for the president, Congressman. Well, Donald Trump was right, though. Uh, first, the White House counsel, Don McGahn, refused to fire the special counsel. Mr. McGahn showed principle and character and refused to do what he knew would be an illegal act. Then Attorney General Sessions, who had recused himself, was asked to unrecuse himself. But Attorney General Sessions also did the right thing. And he said, I'm not going to unrecuse myself because I'd have a conflict, because I did, was involved in the campaign and knew some things, can't do it. Then the White House counsel advised the president not even to contact Sessions. But you, his loyal soldier, would do it. You were different than Sessions and McGahn. Trump could depend on you. You did not ask any questions. You were a loyal soldier. You just wrote down the message and agreed to deliver it. That's what he thought. You took the dictation. You gave it to Hope Hicks. You asked her to type it up for you, not that you couldn't have done it yourself, I'm sure, and then asked somebody else to deliver the message to Sessions when you decided not to. Donald Trump talked to you outside normal channels so there'd be no record of, of anything that he asked you to do to obstruct justice. Nothing to do with that at all. The president knew what he was doing was wrong. Mr. Sessions knew what he was doing was wrong. Mr. McGahn knew what he was doing was wrong. You seemed to be the only person that didn't think it was wrong. But Mr. Trump was wrong, because at the last minute, you got cold feet. You chickened out. The president's trust was misplaced. You decided not to do what you told the president you were going to do, and you handed it off to somebody else. Did you realize at some point that Mr. Ney, your former boss, got involved in criminal problems and went to prison and maybe you were going to be the next one? Did that cross your mind? Did you ever think about Bob Ney's situation and going to prison? Uh, Congressman Ney, Congressman, so we're clear, went to jail many years after I left his, his employment. I'm sure you're going to clarify that for the record. 
and you were his employee, and you had great respect for him, but you learned from that. I'm asking, did you learn from his experience and realize that what you were asked to do was illegal, and you didn't want to follow the same trail as Bob Ney and end up in prison? I wasn't asked to do anything illegal, Congressman. Well, the public will determine that. This has been more obstruction of Congress by this administration, and you followed their instructions, and you're doing just exactly what they thought you'd do. You are a loyal soldier, except you didn't follow Trump's instructions. You chickened out at the last minute. You got cold feet. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewandowski, you ran President Trump's campaign between January 2015 and June 2016. Is that right? Yes. You were at the helm at, of, of the campaign when President Trump secured the Republican nomination. Yes. Pretty good campaign you ran. Thank you. I mean, you beat, what, 17, 18 different opponents, senators, governors, some good senators. Um, of course, you had a pretty good candidate. The best. Pretty good candidate who I think has done a great job as president of the United States. After you left the campaign, I think you left in June of 2016, after you left the head of the campaign, were you still involved with the campaign throughout the rest of the election, all the way up through November 8th, 2016? Yes. In that entire time. So you were part of the campaign operation at some level or another from January 2015 to November 8th, 2016. During that entire time, did you guys ever work with Russia to impact the election? No. And you know what's interesting, Mr. Lewandowski? When Jim Comey was asked that same question, sitting at that same table, he gave the same answer. When Bob Mueller was asked that same question, sitting at that same table, he gave the same answer. Falsely accused, the president is falsely accused of colluding with a foreign state to impact the election. Jim Comey, when we deposed him at that very table, said after 10 months of investigation, we didn't have a thing. Bob Mueller gets named special counsel. He wastes $30 million of taxpayer money, 22-month investigation. He sits at that table just a few weeks ago and gives the same darn answer. These guys over here, they don't care. They don't care. They don't want to get to what Mr. Shabbat said. They don't want to figure out how the false accusation happened. They just want to drag people in front of this committee and keep trying to find some way they can go after the president. Let's go back to the process that the ranking member raised. Um, did you testify in front of the Senate Intel Committee in 2017? Yes. Did you testify in front of the House Intelligence Committee in 2017? Yes. And you went before the special counsel and answered his questions in 2018. Is that right? It is. And you did that all voluntarily? Yes. No subpoena? No, sir. You said, I'm willing to comply, give answers, answer all the questions you got. Yes. I think in your opening statement, you said 20 some, what, how many hours did you set in front of those various committees? More than 20. More than 20 hours. And for this committee, did you get a letter from this committee back in March asking you to comply with certain document re requests that Chairman Nadler wanted to have? I believe so, yes. And you and your legal team complied with that? Yes, sir. And then on June 24th, you got another letter, is that right? Yes. June 24th of this year, you got another letter asking you to do an interview, a transcribed interview in front of the committee. And your lawyer contacted Chairman Nadler and said, we'd be happy to do that. Is that right? Yes. He said, give us some dates. We'll come in. We'll be happy to sit for an interview. That's right. What happened next? Uh, next, about five weeks ago, the committee issued a subpoena for my appearance. So you're willing to come voluntarily, just like you did with Senate Intel, House Intel, just like you did for Bob Mueller, for the special counsel, 20-some hours. You're willing to do that all. You complied with when they asked you for certain documents. And then when they want you to come in for an interview, you said, all right, sure, we'll do it. They hit you with a subpoena. Correct. And then they start calling you names, saying, close up that book, answer the question, start treating you this way. Kind of interesting. They're the ones who started it. They're the ones who slapped you with a subpoena when you were willing to come here voluntarily. I was. And then they, then they, then they, then they questioned what, the, the demeanor you bring here today. I, I mean, first they changed the rules last week in the middle of the Congress change the rules of the committee in the middle of the game, and then today they're not even going to follow the rules because the rules they changed last week talk about staff asking questions at the end, at, after members are done. we got this whole issue with consultants. So this, maybe we would be better served if we did exactly what Mr. Shabbat said. Maybe we would be better served as the House Judiciary Committee if we actually focused on how this whole false accusation started in the first place. What do you think, Mr. Lewandowski? I think it'd be a great idea. Great idea. Maybe, maybe the American people would be better served than 
spending more time investigating something that's already had 32 months of investigation from both Jim Comey and the FBI and Bob Mueller and the special counsel, maybe we would do that. And you know a great place to start? Great place to start, Mr. Chairman? I asked you about this one week ago today. Great place to start would be the Inspector General's report that was issued just three weeks ago, the scathing report about Jim Comey. That'd be a nice place to start. But when I asked the chairman when we might have an opportunity to question Mr. Horowitz, he said, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Of course you haven't thought about that. Too busy trying to impeach the president. Too busy slapping subpoenas on Corey Lewandowski. Of course you haven't thought about that. That's what the committee should be focused on. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, the gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewandowski, you are about like a fish being cleaned with a spoon. It's very hard to get an answer out of you. But let me ask you this, sir. Based on uh, the president's past statements, everybody knows that the president does not like for anybody to take notes when he's talking. In fact, he asked lawyers not to take official notes, and you're aware of that, correct? I'm aware of the public account, sir. All right, fair enough. And, but when the president met with you in the Oval Office 101 on June 19, 2017, to dictate a message to Attorney General Jeff Sessions, he told you to, quote, write this down. Isn't that correct? That's accurate. And it was just you and the president in that meeting, correct? It was. And you knew that you needed to write down as fast as possible what the president was telling you so that you could make sure to capture the content of what he was telling you correctly, correct? I don't know if speed of writing was a criteria, but I tried to capture it to the best of my ability, Congressman. Thank you, sir. And he dictated to you exactly what he wanted you to put into the mouth of Attorney General Jeff Sessions, correct? I believe he asked me to deliver a message for Jeff to consider delivering himself. And it was a message that he intended for Jeff, meaning Jeff Sessions, to deliver out loud and publicly. He wanted the public to know what he was saying, but he wanted Jeff to say it, correct? I believe the Mueller report accurately depicts that. And Mr. Lewandowski, uh, we've projected on the, uh, on the screen the message that the president dictated to you that he wanted you to deliver to the attorney general. It's on the screen, and I'd like for you to read the first two sentences, if you would uh, entertain that. Oh, as, as Director Mueller stated when asked to read from the report, and I quote, no, no, no. I would be happy to have you read it, Congressman. Look, look on the, well, would you prefer for me to read it instead of you? Please. Okay. It says, I know that I recused myself from certain things having to do with specific areas, but our POTUS is being treated very unfairly. That's what he told you to write down, and that's what you wrote down. And I'll continue. He said, he shouldn't have a special prosecutor counsel because he hasn't done anything wrong. Now, that's what he wanted you to deliver to Attorney General Jeff Sessions, correct? I believe that's an accurate representation. And he wanted you to deliver it to Jeff so that Jeff could say it to the people, right? I believe so. And uh, you felt kind of squeamish, like, a, like that fish that you are trying to be right now being scaled, you felt a little squeamish about delivering that message, correct? No, sir. Well, why didn't you, uh, why did it take you so long and you never even delivered it? Correct, I never delivered the message. Yeah, you chickened out. I went on vacation. You went on vacation. <laughs> and so you put, the, you put the message in the safe, in your safe, in your home for safekeeping, correct? Before you went on vacation. I took my kids to the beach, Congressman. That was more and, of a priority. And, and President Trump was hounding you about when are you going to deliver that message, correct? Completely inaccurate, Congressman. Well, he asked you about it a, a few times, didn't he? No, he did not. He never asked you whether or not you had delivered that message? Not on multiple occasions, no. He, one occasion, okay? He did mention it on one occasion to you. I don't know if that's in the report, sir, or and, not. And you, and you told him that, yeah, I'm going to get around to it. I'm going to deliver it, correct? 
I'd have to see the reference to the Mueller report where that well, is, it, sir. It's in the re report. And you direct me to the book it. and page so I can well, review I, that? I don't need to waste any time with that, but let me tell you something. Uh, the next three sentences, uh, uh, after those first two, would you read those, please? Uh, you're welcome to, Congressman. Okay. He said he shouldn't have a special cons uh, prosecutor or counsel because he hasn't done anything wrong. I was on the campaign with him for nine months. There were no Russians involved with him. I know it for a fact because I was there. Now, the president wanted Attorney General to say that, but you didn't deliver the message. And you knew that Attorney General uh, Sessions had recused himself at that time. And since he had recused himself, you knew that it would have been against the law for him to comment in any way on that investigation. Isn't that right? I did not know that. You did not know that. You did not know that. Correct. The time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Colorado. Thank you for putting up with uh, the harassment that you're putting up with right now. According to the Alliance for Securing Democracy, Russia interfered in the elections of Belarus, Bulgaria, Canada, Cyprus, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, France, Georgia, Germany, Hungary, Italy, Latvia, Lithuania, Macedonia, Moldova, Montenegro, Norway, Poland, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, Turkey, United Kingdom, Ukraine, and the United States. They specifically targeted the Scottish independence vote, the Brexit vote, uh, and Angela Merkel. Despite knowledge of these kinds of election threats, the Obama administration sat idly by. Instead of warning the Trump campaign, Loretta Lynch's DOJ and James Comey's FBI used secret surveillance to spy on members of the Trump campaign, all while allowing election interference to occur. Why isn't this hearing focused on holding DOJ and FBI leadership accountable for this kind of terrible malfeasance and lack of judgment? What was Putin's ultimate goal? Clint Watts, a former FBI agent and counterterrorism specialist, said it is to attack and undermine democracy. He said the goal is to leave voters feeling as if, quote, either the institutions are corrupt or you can't trust the vote, end of quote. This is the kind of classic disinformation campaign that the KGB runs. And as we all know, Vladimir Putin was a former leader of the KGB. In 2016, Putin's goal could have been very simple. Divide the American electorate, sow seeds of distrust, make it impossible for whoever won our election to govern. With America weakened at home, we would be weakened on the international stage. Putin wins with a weakened America, regardless of who won the election. This is the kind of approach that has been used by the communists in Russia for nearly a century. After overthrowing Russian Tsar Nicholas II in 1917, Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Lenin, I'm sorry, different Vladimir, and the communists, utilized Western journalists as propaganda tools to defend communism. New York Times journalist John Reed, for example, defended the Bolsheviks advocating against American intervention. Lenin used even the term useful idiots to describe how leftist-leaning, communist-sympathizing Americans could be easily tricked and used to help the, the, the Russians. For the past three years, Democrats have focused on undermining America's president instead of working with President Trump and Republicans in Congress to harden our election defenses. I think there would be broad bipartisan support that we need to, for, to prevent future election meddling. The Mueller report makes clear that President Trump wanted to focus on protecting our democracy from future attacks. So I have one question, Mr. Lewandowski. It's clear that Putin attacked America with the goal of dividing the American people, and today's hearing is being held for the sole purpose of attacking America's president, which will weaken our country on the international stage. Do you believe that Vladimir Putin is sitting in his office right now in the Kremlin, laughing at what those on the other side of the aisle are doing, and believing that those on the other side of the aisle are useful idiots helping... Objection, Mr. I have a, a point of order. The lady will state her point of order. Um, I have a point of order. According to the rules, uh, and the rules of this committee and the House rules, um, we cannot attribute uh, derogatory names to our colleagues or motives to our colleagues. And I believe the gentleman said those on the other side of the aisle are idiots. 
Uh, this is a very sacred and somber responsibility. I've taken an oath of office, my good friend, just like you did. I am concerned about the Constitution just as you are, and I would not engage uh, in any behavior that could be described as idiot. Never in my life or my colleagues have we ever discussed behaving like idiots. Mr. Chairman, that is an inappropriate terminology and description of the members of this House or Republicans or Democrats, no matter what position I will, um, they are. Mr. Chairman, I, I, will over, I, will overrule, I will overrule the point of order. The rules of decorum refer to motive. Calling someone an idiot is not flattering, but it does not go to motive. Um, and I believe we should have the, mo the most robust debate. I believe we should respect each other, but uh, I, I don't think we should, um, but um, I don't think that goes to motive, and accordingly, I'm going to overrule the, ruin of the point of order. General, we'll proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, I didn't call anybody an idiot. I, I said useful idiot. Useful idiot. And, <laughs> and secondly, I uh, asked the witness whether he believed that as part of Vladimir Putin's strategy, he, uh, Vladimir Putin, was being aided by useful idiots in, in America. Your answer, sir. You know, Congressman, I, I can't be sure to the motives of Vladimir Putin or the Russians who want to interfere with our election process in 2016, but I can be certain of one thing. Donald Trump was a private citizen at the time, and he had no more responsibility or authority to secure the integrity of the 2016 election cycle than I did. That responsibility fell to the intelligence community and the Obama-Biden administration. They clearly failed. Never did they contact under my tenure, me to inform, of, of, inform me or anyone at the campaign at the time of any potential hacking which may have been transpiring. Never did they contact us to alert us of any potential security violations as it related to the election. And so I think uh, Mr. Comey, Mr. Brennan, and Mr. Clapper ultimately own the responsibilities ahead of the intelligence community to understand why they did not do a better job of protecting the American electorate in 2016 to ensure we didn't have foreign interference. And, and Mr. Lewandowski, had they contacted you, what would have be been your response in terms of notifying others on the election uh, in terms of their dealing with uh, Russians? We would have worked with them. Uh, I would have recommended working through council to work with them to notify them of any potential contacts, which I don't ever recall having. But if we would have had any, I would have made sure we notified the appropriate authorities immediately. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Florida. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewandowski, I just wanted to follow up on Mr. Johnson. Uh, the Mueller report, volume two, page 90, says one month later, this is a month after your June 19th meeting, presumably after you returned from vacation, the president met again with Lewandowski followed up on the request to have Sessions limit the scope of the Russia investigation, um, just to clarify that he did do that. But I want to go back to that meeting on June 19th. The president asked you to write down word for word a script that he wanted the Attorney General of the United States to deliver. Isn't that correct? I'm sorry, can you just give me the reference again, Congressman? Uh, well, I'll, let me do this. Previously, you testified, and because it's reported in the Mueller report, that the president asked Lewandowski to deliver a message to Sessions and write this down. This is page 91. This was the first time the president asked him to take dictation. You wrote as fast as possible. The notes that you took at that meeting are on the screen. Um, if you could, I don't know that the notes are. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read, the, read the section of the notes that you took uh, that were, again, this is what you were asked to deliver to the Attorney General of the United States to announce in public. I know I recuse myself from certain things having to do with specific areas, but our POTUS is being treated very unfairly. He shouldn't have a special <coughs> prosecutor counsel because he, has, he hasn't done anything wrong. I was on the campaign with him for nine months. There were no Russians involved with him. I know for a fact because I was there. He didn't do anything wrong except run the greatest campaign in American history. That's from page 91. Um, that's, again, that's what President Trump wanted the Attorney General to say in public about the special counsel's investigation. Is that right? I believe that's an accurate representation. So this is in June of 2017. You said that you didn't know about, you didn't know about uh, the Attorney General being barred from participating, uh, speaking out about the Russia investigation. Um, the public didn't know about all these attempts to influence the investigation at that time. But what we did know, what everyone knew, Mr. Lewandowski, was that the president's campaign was under investigation, and they knew the attorney general couldn't touch it. 
because he was a major part of the campaign. He advised on national security matters. And back in March, he had recused himself. Uh, he had recused himself from anything having to do with the investigation. You didn't, you weren't aware of that at all? That what he did in March and the fact that he had recused himself? I was aware of the Attorney General's recusal. And so when the President asked you to deliver a speech that he wanted the Attorney General who could not participate in the investigation, couldn't talk about anything having to do with the investigation, he recused himself. When the President asked you uh, to deliver that word-for-word -word speech for him, that there was no inconsistency with that and the fact that the Attorney General had recused himself, you knew that he had, and you knew that he couldn't participate in any way. I'm not an attorney, Congressman. I'm not asking you as an attorney. I am, but that's not, how, that's not why I'm asking you. I'm just asking you if you knew that he had recused himself. You did, right? I'm aware of the public reports that Jeff Sessions recused himself from the investigation. And by recusing himself, you're aware of the public reports that, and what was in his, his recusal statement on March 2nd of 2017, that he wasn't going to participate uh, in any existing or future investigations of any matters relating to the campaign for president. You knew that was out there. So when the president asked you to specifically go in there and, and ask him to deliver a speech, which was contrary to that, forget about being a lawyer. Did it, did it strike you as off in any way? Were you concerned in any way? No, sir. Was it the right decision for Sessions to recuse himself? Well, I can't comment on Jeff Sessions' decision-making process. Um, so here's what he, here's what he did. The, the script says, a group of people want to subvert the Constitution. I'm going to meet with the special prosecutor to explain this is very unfair and let the special prosecutor move forward with investigating election mailing for future elections so that nothing can happen in future elections. He, the president, you'll agree, was trying to force the investigation to focus only on the future so it didn't focus on him. Isn't that right, Mr. Lewandowski? I don't agree to that. That's not what, when you look only in the future and you're not allowed to look at the one investigation into the president, that's not how you interpret that? You interpret it differently? I think that could be your interpretation. It is, I think it's an obvious interpretation. If we have more time, I'd ask what, your is, what yours is, but I'll just close with this. A month, he asked you to do this, he brought you in to talk to the Attorney General because the president was terrified, Mr. Lewandowski, a month before your meeting, the special counsel was appointed and the president said, oh my God, this is terrible. He wanted you to pressure the attorney general, someone who wasn't even allowed to talk about the investigation, to block him from looking at his own conduct. Mr. Lewandowski, that's abuse of power. And as we go on through this investigation, I hope you'll be able to, to further elaborate on how you could have seen this in any other light than the obvious way the president attempted to abuse his power. General, back. time has expired. The witness may answer the question. Thank you. The gentleman from, uh, Texas. from Texas. Gen gentleman from Texas, Mr. Radcliffe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewandowski, uh, welcome to what my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have alternati alternatively described and argued over the past week as an impeachment inquiry, an impeachment investigation, an impeachment probe, and an impeachment proceeding. Now, if you're confused which one, I assure you, you're not alone. Uh, a lot of the folks that are watching today might be confused because they might be thinking that impeachment proceedings are supposed to be initiated after a vote by the full House of Representatives, and they'd be right. But you see, the Democrats, now the party of impeachment, tried that three times and failed miserably three times, twice before the Mueller report and then once again after the Mueller report. So last week, the party of impeachment, which is in charge of this committee, changed our rules so that they could get to impeachment in a different way. And Mr. Lewandowski, you're lucky you're the first witness for the party of impeachment's new impeachment procedure. I feel very lucky. Thank you. You should. Uh, now, I know that you've testified uh, before the House, before the Senate, and before the special counsel. But in fairness, Mr. Lewandowski, that's when my colleagues on the other side of the aisle were promising the American people that there was going to be impeachment by collusion or impeachment by conspiracy, which, of course, didn't exist, and the special counsel said it didn't exist. So then they had to shift and say, well, now it's going to be impeachment by obstruction of justice. Remember that they promised. They promised that uh, special counsel Mueller was going to breathe life into impeachment by obstruction of justice, but instead he put it to death. I don't know if you remember, but I asked him. 
Can you give me an example other than Donald Trump where the Justice Department determined that an investigated person was not exonerated because their innocence was not conclusively determined? And his answer was, I cannot. Do you remember that? So as it turns out, um, all 200, nearly 200 pages of the Mueller report and the analysis of in volume two of obstruction of justice was done under a legal standard and legal burden of proof that is not recognized and ever been used before in American jurisprudence. But the party of impeachment, they're gonna gloss over that today. They're also gonna gloss over the fact that the inspector general um, criminally referred the FBI director who leaked the information to get the special counsel in the first place. And the same inspector general who found that uh, facts establishing that that same FBI director was in fact targeting Donald Trump at the same time in an investigation where he said he wasn't investigating Donald Trump. Now, you might think that this committee would be interested in hearing from that inspector general for the first time rather than hearing from you for the fourth time. But maybe you can be helpful because the party of impeachment, they don't care, Mr. Lewandowski, what kind of impeachment you can deliver for them. There are 135 Democrats and socialists uh, in the House of Representatives that have publicly come out for impeachment. They're in agreement the president needs to be impeached. The problem is they've come up with more than a dozen different reasons that they're arguing about are the basis for that impeachment. We've talked about impeachment by collusion. We've talked about impeachment by conspiracy. We've talked about impeachment by obstruction of justice. Let's cover a few more. Impeachment under the emoluments clause. Did the first and only president rich enough uh, to largely self-fund a successful presidential campaign ever admit to you that he secretly ran for president to get rich? No, sir. Okay. He's already very rich. Did, uh, do you have any information or evidence, uh, Mr. Lewandowski, about uh, crimes the president committed <clears throat> for ignoring congressional subpoenas as a basis of impeachment? I do not. How about um, dangling pardons? Do you know if the president, did he ever admit or say to you that he would pardon anybody in law enforcement who was trying to enforce or protect our territorial borders? Uh, at the request of the White House, I can't discuss private conversations that may or may not occur with the president. Okay, well, how about this one? How about impeachment by using a Sharpie on a hurricane weather map? Did the president ever admit or say to you that he intentionally committed an impeachable high crime by magic marker, as some of my Democratic colleagues are contending? Again, Congressman, I can't discuss any private conversation I may have had well, with the President. I'm sorry, you're frankly not being helpful at all, Mr. Lewandowski. Maybe um, you don't understand that the party of impeachment, they're not picky at all. They don't even care if you don't have impeachment. Uh, if you got anything on Donald Trump, how about on Justice Kavanaugh? Because this morning, now they say they want to impeach Justice Kavanaugh. Have you got anything that supports impeachment of Justice Kavanaugh? He's a good man. Well, listen, I, um, I know you're disappointed that you've only been here four times, but don't you think that there isn't going to be another opportunity because this committee has become the search party for impeachment, and they're going to bring back anybody as much as they have to to find something, anything to keep this impeachment hoax alive. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, 15 seconds over time. The uh, lady from California. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Lewandowski, I want to follow up from my colleague here, Mr. Deutsch. Um, it's clear that the president was desperate for you to deliver the message to Sessions. Everyone else had said no, and he went to great lengths to make sure that you'd be effective in delivering it. After the president dictated the message, he told you to tell the attorney general that he would be the most popular guy in the country if he delivered that message to limit the investigation to the future. Is that correct? Could you reference me to that in the report, please? Yes, it's in volume two, page 92. So is that correct? I'd like to reference okay, well, that. Well, while you're looking, I'm gonna move on. So the president is telling you how to convince Sessions to do it. It's page 92, first paragraph to tell Sessions that he'd be the most popular guy in the country if he did what the president ordered. And the president picked you for a reason because he knew that you had the traits of an enforcer and described yourself as his, quote, loyal soldier. This was no exception. Did you find it now? I have it here, Congressman. Okay, Thank you. so the attorney general, that he would be the most popular guy in the country if he delivered that message. Do you see that on page 92? I do. So is that correct? I believe it's accurate. 
And you told the president that you understood what he wanted Sessions to do. Is that what you told the special counsel? Same page. And you did understand what the president wanted. He knew not to create a trail. So looking at the slide, Lewandowski wanted to pass the message to Sessions in person rather than on the phone. Where is that? After you left the Oval Office, you didn't schedule an, an official meeting with Sessions. Instead, you called the Attorney General at home, correct? If that's what's in the report. You told Sessions you wanted to meet in person rather than on the phone. You could have just read the message from the President over the phone, but you knew that it would make it harder to persuade Sessions to do what you wanted. So you wanted to meet with him in person, correct? If that's what the report states, yes. So the Attorney General works at the Department of Justice, but you told the Special Counsel that you didn't want to meet in the Department of Justice because you knew that if you went into a government building that there's a public log of the visit, and you specifically told the Special Counsel that you did not want to quote a public, law of your, a public log of your visit. Isn't that right? That's accurate. So why is that? Why didn't you want to leave a paper trail for your visit? Well, Jeff and I are friends socially. And I want to have the opportunity to have a meal with Jeff and relay the conversation which the president asked me to ask Jeff to consider giving. So if that was the case, then why was there a problem with you having to do it in secret, essentially? I mean, it was a very important message you were delivering from the president, and it was a message that could certainly be viewed as completely inappropriate considering that you were not even an employee of the White House. You're a private citizen. You're delivering a message to the Attorney General to limit the investigation. So if you didn't think you were doing anything wrong, then why would it matter that there was a public log? I want to have the opportunity to speak with Jeff in a more relaxed atmosphere and have a meal with him to have the conversation. Well, you said that another reason for not meeting at the DOJ was because you, quote, did not want Sessions to have an advantage over you by meeting on Sessions' turf. Is that right? That's right. I want to have a private conversation in a more relaxed atmosphere. So again, if this was an appropriate message to deliver, and if it was just about that, why would it matter whose turf it was on? Why couldn't you go to his office? You're his friend. Why couldn't you go to his office and meet with him there? I, I suppose I could have, but I chose to have a, I wanted to have a discussion with Jeff, as we have had so many occasions before that. Exactly. I mean, I, I, I believe Never inside the Department I of Justice. I believe that Sessions knew that it was wrong, and that Sessions canceled his meeting with you. If you guys were good friends, why would he have bothered to cancel it? Did he call you up to reschedule it? That'd be a question for Jeff Sessions. Well, after you testified, uh, and you testified earlier that after the inauguration, you didn't communicate with the Attorney General, often your good friend that you have dinner with. So when you said that you had a message to deliver, isn't it fair to say that Sessions knew you were calling on behalf of the President and that that message was from him? I have no idea what was in Jeff Sessions' well, mind. To, to be clear, the Attorney General knew it was a message from the President and he still refused to meet with you. Mr. Lewandowski, it's clear to me that Sessions knew what we all know sitting here today, that what you were doing was wrong. He wanted nothing to do with your secret messages because he knew it was entirely improper for a private citizen to go behind the backs of the White House counsel and secretly meet with him somewhere without any record of your meeting on your turf to try to persuade the Attorney General to protect the President from investigation into his own misconduct. Well, you know, you can't protect him anymore. And I'm glad that this misconduct can finally be brought to public attention so that the President can be held accountable. The gentlelady's time has expired. The witness has requested a short recess. The committee will resume in five minutes. The committee stands in recess.
And welcome back everyone here to news now as we're going to break day two over going to break. We were listening to this for almost two hours there the of the uh, obstruction of justice hearing as the only witness there. Corey Lewandowski, former President Trump campaign manager back there in 2015. So, uh, you know, you just never know what you are going to get with these types of hearings. And we heard, you know, in the very beginning, uh, there was a lot of circus back and forth between the Democrats and the Republicans. And they said they're just going to be taking a five minute break. I know we'll be off by uh, by that time right here on Fox 10 Extra, but you're always please invited to continue the News Now experience on our YouTube page uh, at Fox 10 Phoenix. That way you get to see more of this. It's expected, it's expected to go another two hours. I wanna show you, we're, we're not gonna go to another story here just because we gotta keep it now in the frame of, uh, well, the last two hours we were on this hearing. Let's just keep it all the way to the end here on Fox 10 Extra. Let's show you some of the highlights from a little bit ago. Desire to quote, fight all the subpoenas, unquote. The White House's obstruction of Congress ranges across nearly every committee and virtually every investigation of the administration, whether related to children in cages, botched security clearances, or their failure to defend the country from ongoing attacks by a foreign adversary. Well, Mr. Lewandowski, you are here under subpoena. That means you are required to answer our questions, all our questions, completely and truthfully. Our investigation also extends beyond the four corners of the Mueller report. We are looking at corruption and abuse of power more broadly, so we will inquire about other subjects as well. We will not be daunted by the cover-up. We intend to secure accountability for any wrongdoing, because no one is above the law, not even the President of the United States. I now recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, for his opening statement. Well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for introducing uh, this hearing, which is now, as you said, under the new rules. You know, it's sort of the old school, the old rules of the new rules, the new rules of the old rules. These were new these were rules that were here all along. And yet, here we go again. We're going to say that they're new because we like the packaging. I've never seen a majority so amazed with packaging in all my life. You know why? Because they can't sell what's inside. They can't sell the product. So they just keep packaging it differently. You know, I think we should call, I agree with my chairman, I think we should call this for what it is. It's just another simple oversight hearing. In fact, no, I think it's actually become this. It has become, let's read the Mueller report for audiobook. That's what we've become. We had Mr. Mueller here. Had a long day of it. Judging by all accounts, it didn't go real well. For the purpose of what you've proclaimed for over nine months and almost two years, that there's impeachable offenses, as my chairman has said, clearly in the Mueller report. But here's the problem. 17 of the members of the Judiciary Committee have said that they think the president ought to be impeached. So why are we still investigating it? 17, you get some more. The problem is you don't have the votes. You don't have the numbers. And even if you got it out of this committee, you don't have it on the floor. That's your problem. So the thing that we're going to do is, is we're going to drag this committee through oversight hearings Talking about things that have been talked about at nauseum, at nauseum, at nauseum. We're going to talk about it. We're going to put filters up. We're going to say what it really is or really is not. While in all the things, we're going to try to imply that this president shouldn't be president. You know, it is really interesting to me that we just said, just heard just a moment ago, that it was said that these made up rules at DOJ. Well, it's interesting that now they're made up rules. They wasn't made up rules when Obama administration used them. Were they made up rules then? Just asking for a friend. 
You know, this is amazing. As we come into this situation, the, the chairman also said that while we're doing this and, and stopping committees from searching into products like the, the immigration issue and foreign influence, I just want to remind everybody here watching and everybody here to, to see the, the show today and also to remind the majority that they have complete jurisdiction over immigration. We have complete and total jurisdiction over immigration for the most part. All we have to do is if you want to fix the border, put a bill up. You don't want to do that. You like this. You like having the press here. You like the cameras. Because it makes it appear like something's happening that's not. But the real, real, real thing is coming out starting, the American people are starting to get it. They're starting to get it that if you're just howling at the wind, you're not doing anything. You're making them think you are, but you're not. So don't tell me, don't bring to me immigration anymore that you want to deal with. it. You just want to bring administration officials in here and yell at them because what you don't like is happening. And I agree, we need to fix it. Bring us a bill. Bring my bill. Bring your bill. But do something about it. Quit talking about it. Foreign influence. The only real thing we all agree on in the Mueller report was foreign influence from Russia. But yet, where's the bill? Where's the bill? Where's Waldo? Where's the bill? We don't do anything about it. We like to talk about it because we think it makes the president look bad. Because that's the implication we've been giving for two years. Unfortunately, we also don't really want information in this committee either. If we did, we'd work like the Intel Committee had done. You know, we've been, had that issue before. They'd have to actually work with witnesses to get them to come in. Mr. Landowski, I believe, said he'd come without a subpoena, but yet we subpoenaed him anyway. Because it looks, oh, as, my, as, as I was told earlier this year, from the chairman's perspective, a subpoena is a start of a dialogue. Not according to Black's Law Dictionary, but who cares? We're just the Judiciary Committee. This is the problem we're having. This committee does not want to interview Don McGahn behind closed doors. They want him in front of everybody. They want to do this out front. They don't try to actually get information. That's what real oversight is. Real oversight is trying to get information. But we don't do that. I understand it's tough making a promise and not keeping it. I understand. All of us in this room can relate to a time when we kept, made a promise and we couldn't keep it. My majority made a promise. We'll impeach him. We'll investigate him. For most of them, it happened in November 2016 because they couldn't believe that Donald Trump won. And they still can't get over it today. So what do we do? We have public hearings, lots of flashbulbs, embarrassing the president, not gathering facts, not investigating, not doing oversight. This is certainly not being fair, but we like to issue subpoenas. We're setting a world record at that. 40 times faster than the previous chairman. But we don't want any answers because we're not willing to engage in dialogue to get information from folks. And you know how I really don't, I, I believe that this is more just wanting to get it here? is because it's not like Mr. Lewandowski has had silence on this issue. He's testified before Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. He's testified before House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. And now he's also voluntarily testified for the special counsel, by the way, it's Mr. Mueller. And we've had access to all of his summaries of his, of his testimony. This is not new. But yet it is new because it's another time to rehash an old story. You know, this is the fall. This is when the, the, the uh, ABC and NBC and all, the, all the, the broadcast folks, they bring out their new shows. This isn't the summer rerun season. We should get into something new, but I just want to show you one last thing before I turn it back over and, you know, we'll get the popcorn and the show going. The Judiciary Committee is the Judiciary Committee for a reason. It's because we oversee the court system. And for any person who has actually been here, and actually an attorney in this room who's actually appeared before a judge, a judge is pretty stickler for rules. And I just want to point out something. It may be trivial, and I know some will laugh and some won't care, but for some of us it does matter. The subpoena today for Mr. Lewandowski and the others, said 10 a.m. this morning. This just shows you how impulsive and poorly designed this entire sort of faux impeachment charade we're doing. The subpoena is not even properly. The subpoenas were here for all three to compel them at 10 o'clock this morning, but today's hearing's at 1, not 10. The witnesses lack appropriate notice for the hearing today. That's a simple, basic subpoena issue. But we're the Judiciary Committee. I can understand this, and no offense, natural resources, I can understand if they get it wrong or transportation. I don't understand how judiciary gets this wrong. The chairman wants to hold people in contempt for not showing up. Try to enforce this in court because there's no extra letter. There's no clarification of time. And when I was given a subpoena for my client to appear in court, what time do you appear in court? Whenever you feel like it? No, at the time it says, unless the court or the officer giving the subpoena says differently. 
The chairman's only option for success here is to issue, well, we could do this, I guess, because we've wasted enough time on other things. We reissue new subpoenas with a new date, new time, and hold a new hearing. There's probably a date somewhere in October we haven't filled up with this mess somewhere. So with this, here we go. Mr. Chairman, there's so much that we could actually do together. There's so much. But as long as we don't have time, we'll continue with rerun season. Popcorn still tastes good. I don't know why we do this, except maybe we just have maybe a deficiency of flashbulbs. I don't know, because we just like the show. And the show is going to get even more as it goes today, because the new rules are in effect. Oh, wait, they're not new. They're just old, but we're applying one day because we want it to look better. And I have one more of those we'll talk about later uh, when we get to some other questions later. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Collins. I will now introduce today's witness. Corey Lewandowski is a political consultant and commentator. He previously served as the first campaign manager for Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Mr. Lewandowski received a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Massachusetts and a master's degree in political science from American University. He also attended the Naval War College. Former White House Deputy Chief of Staff Rick Dearborn and former White House Staff Secretary Robert Porter have refused to appear today despite duly issued subpoenas from this committee. As I discussed in my opening statement, I strongly disagree with the White House's assertion of absolute immunity as to Mr. Dearborn and Mr. Porter. We are considering all available options to enforce these subpoenas. We welcome Mr. Lewandowski and we thank him for participating in today's hearing. Now, if you please rise, I will begin by swearing you in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? So help you God. Let the record show that the witness has answered in the affirmative. Thank you and please be seated. Please note that your written statement will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, there's a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. Ms. Lewandowski, you may begin. Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, and members of the committee, good afternoon. I'd like to start off by expressing my hope that today's hearing will be productive in revealing the truth both to the committee and to the American people. For the record, and as you likely know, I have already testified before Congress on three separate occasions. I sat at length with the staff of the Special Counsel's Office. There too, my time and answers were given freely and without hesitation. I think in one form or another, I've already answered questions for well over 20 hours. So now here I am before the House Judiciary Committee to answer the same questions again. Just last week, this committee, over the objections of the minority, unilaterally changed the rules to make this an impeachment proceeding, which is very unfair. However, in the spirit of cooperation, I am prepared to move forward today. I'd like to start by recounting the events that brought us to this point. My story of joining the Trump campaign, working through a historic election, and continuing to have the privilege to be part of the greatest political movement in our nation's history. I present this summary in the interest of truth and transparency to the American people, the very same reason and rationale that this committee offers as the basis for today's hearing. Growing up in a blue collar, single parent family in Lowell, Massachusetts, I learned the value of hard work. And that work ethic helped me to put myself through both college and graduate school. Prior to becoming a congressional staffer, and ultimately a certified peace officer in the state of New Hampshire. However, the world of politics was always a passion. And in January of 2015, Donald J. Trump, then a private citizen, hired me to help him explore a possible run for the presidency. It was an honor and a privilege to play a small part of such a historic campaign. The campaign started as a small group of individuals helping Mr. Trump to make the decision in June of 2015 to ride down the golden escalator and seek the Republican nomination for presidency of the United States. For more than a year, I served as campaign manager to then candidate Trump in his historic campaign, where I led a lean and dedicated operation that succeeded in helping him capture the Republican nomination. My job was simple, provide Mr. Trump with my best advice, spend his money like it was my own, and give him the support he needed to win. I also set long-term long -term objectives and managed day-to-day -day decisions. I had the privilege, and it was a privilege, of helping transform the Trump campaign 
from a dedicated but small makeshift organization to a historical and unprecedented political juggernaut. And I am proud to say Mr. Trump won 38 primaries and caucuses and received more votes than any candidate in the history of the Republican Party, all while being outspent most of the way. The historic campaign helped Mr. Trump secure the Republican nomination and ultimately the presidency of the United States. However, since Election Day, whether it was bad actors at the FBI and the intelligence community or lies coming from members of the current House majority, groundswell of support for impeachment, ensuring that Americans <coughs> would want to tar and feather the president, run him out of Washington on a rail, deprive the American people of the president that they duly elected. Well, that didn't turn out to be the case. So then it was all about bringing the attorney general in, Bill Barr. He was certainly going to point out the inconsistencies and flaws in the analysis. Well, that didn't happen because the majority wanted to insist that their unelected staff ask questions of the Attorney General of the United States. But no, they said, we'll go to court, we'll win, we'll force Bill Barr and Don McGahn to come and testify. They're not winning in court. They're not here. It's a joke. For the last four months, the path the majority has taken us on has rambled from disorganized to just downright dizzying. In June, Speaker Pelosi said the House Democratic Caucus was, and I'm quoting, not even close to an impeachment inquiry. That was to CNN. In July, House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler said, quote, an impeachment inquiry is when you consider only impeachment. That's not what we're doing. We're investigating all of this. But then in August, in a CNN interview, Nadler said, this is a formal impeachment proceeding. Then in September, when asked if the Democrats are engaged in an impeachment inquiry, the House Majority Leader Steny Hoyard answered, no. It was the gentlelady from Washington who said just recently, Ms. Jayapal, we have been in the midst of an impeachment investigation. She said that to Politico. But then in the very same story, the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Uh, Himes, said, no, we're not in an impeachment investigation. Then the gentleman from New York, Mr. Gregory Meeks, said, when asked if the House was investigating impeachment, he said, well, Maybe there's, we don't know whether an impeachment investigation has begun. It's just dizzying. Last week, it was the Judiciary Committee Chairman, Jerry Nadler, who said, what we're doing is very clear. It's been very clear. It continues to be very clear. The Speaker has backed us at every point along the way. This process has been about as clear as Joe Biden's last answer to race relations that involved turning on the record player. We don't know where we are or what we're doing. Now, Mr. Lewandowski, I am not allowed by House rules to impugn the motives of my colleagues or to speculate as to what might be animating this bizarre circumstance. But those rules don't apply to you. So, Mr. Lewandowski, do you have a thought as to why we continue to engage in a charade that is overwhelmingly opposed by the American people and fundamentally misunderstood by my Democrat colleagues? You know, Congressman, I think they hate this president more than they love their country. Mr. Lewandowski, Mr. Lewandowski, you were the campaign manager for the president's campaign when the Obama-Biden administration was notified that there might be efforts by the Russians to interfere with our election, isn't that right? Yes. And can you describe for us the briefing you got as the campaign manager to ensure that our system was resilient and American democracy was pr protected? There was no briefing provided by anybody from the Obama-Biden administration, members of the intelligence community, or uh, the FBI to our campaign that I, when I was present or during my tenure as the campaign manager. I mean, that's, that's just baffling to me. I mean, our, our democracy is so precious. We have to cherish it. We have to protect it. And, and yet when the Obama-Biden administration knew that there might be nefarious efforts to interfere or co-opt or in any way disturb our democracy, they didn't say anything to you. Now, as you sit here today, having watched these facts unfold, do you have any, any uh, rationale as to why maybe the Clapper 
Brennan, Comey, Obama, Biden team didn't want to give the Trump campaign a fair defensive briefing about the threats that we were facing? It's actually unfathomable to me that they didn't contact the major political nominee for president of the United States and inform them of potential threats against the election process in 2016. And we could be finding that out now. I mean, we could have those people before our committee to figure out what in the world happened that didn't allow us to get those answers. One final question for you, Mr. Lewandowski. Has an inspector general employed by the United States government ever accused you of breaking the law? No. No, but they have done that with James Comey, and yet the leadership of this committee will not bring James Comey before, even though the inspector general said that his work impaired the credibility and efforts of over 35,000 FBI agents and the brave people fighting for our country. It's a shame that you're here, Mr. Lewandowski. Jim Comey should be sitting in that chair. He should be answering questions about why he did so much damage to the FBI in our country, including not giving you the briefing that you are entitled to. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, who? The gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Nadler. Uh, before I begin, let me remind you, uh, Mr. Lewandowski, that this is not a Republican primary campaign. You are not on the campaign trail yet. This is the House Judiciary Committee. Act like you know the difference. You've never worked for the Trump White House in any official capacity, correct? That's right. But you do speak with President Trump with some regularity, true? I think it's a fair statement. In fact, during the summer of 2017, uh, according to testimony to the special counsel, you were summoned to the White House by President Trump on at least two occasions, correct? I don't believe the report says that, Congressman. Okay, well, you met with the president one-on-one -on, -one on June 19th, 2017, and then again on July 19th, 2017, correct? Yes, I believe that's accurate. Okay, let's try to get some clarity on what exactly you do uh, for Donald Trump since you're not a government employee. Uh, you stated during the 2016 Republican National Convention that uh, I got the reputation as a tough guy. That's my reputation. Do you recall making that statement, Mr. Lewandowski? I don't. Okay. It's in the public record. Your job is to be Donald Trump's political enforcer, correct? No, I don't believe so. Let me ask the question another way. Are you the hit man, the bag man, the lookout, or all of the above? I think I'm the good looking man, actually. Okay. President Trump told you on June 19th, 2017, to personally deliver a message to Attorney General Sessions that would have ended the criminal investigation into the Trump campaign, correct? I don't believe that's what the Mueller report states, no. President Trump wanted Attorney General Sessions to limit the special counsel's investigation to future incidents of election foreign interference, true? Which page is that on, Congressman? Uh, that's in the public record, it's in this hearing, it's in the Mueller report. Now the White House has a legal protocol for presidential statements. Under the Presidential Records Act, uh, they must preserve all memos, letters, emails, papers, like the note he dictated to you. Uh, so you wrote down the president's message, which you then stored in a safe in your home. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. You told the special counsel that was your standard procedure with sensitive items, correct? Where is that reference in the report to it's you, sensitive vol items? Vol volume 2, page 92. A matter Let me just of reference record. that one second, Congressman. You don't Thank have you. to reference it. The president asked you, you to say page 90, Congress. The president asked you to rec reclaiming my time. The president asked you to record a message from him on June 19th because he wanted to hide his message from eventual disclosure. Isn't that right? No. Okay. But you never delivered the message to Jeff Sessions after that June 19th meeting. True. That's accurate. Instead, you testified that you went on vacation. Correct. I did. How long was your vacation, Mr. Lewandowski? Oh, it was lengthy. I think at least two weeks. At least two weeks. But you were summoned again to the White House on July 19th, 30 days after the original June 19th meeting, true? I believe that's accurate, yes. So you weren't on vacation the entire time, correct? Oh, I didn't say I was on vacation the entire time. I was on vacation for two weeks, Congressman. Right, but you still failed to deliver the message, and it had nothing to do, at least in part, to your so-called vacation. Um, now, the July 19th meeting occurred 
Just a few days after new information came to light about Russian operatives meeting with high-level Trump campaign officials, when you're summoned to the White House after that July 19th meeting, by that time, you still hadn't delivered the message uh, to Jeff Sessions. You said to the president you would do it soon, according to volume two, page 93, correct? If that's what the report says, that's accurate. Okay, President Trump also asked you to deliver a message to Attorney General Sessions that if he didn't do what was requested, he would be fired, correct? Volume two, page 93. I think that's what was reported, yes. Okay, President Trump wanted you to intimidate Attorney General Sessions, correct? Well, you'd have to ask President Trump that. Okay, now you stated earlier today that President Trump asked you to take down dictation, quote, many times, is that correct? It is. But on page 91, volume two of the Mueller report, it states, quote, the president then asked Lewandowski to deliver a message to Sessions and said, quote, write this down, close quote. This was the first time the president had asked Lewandowski to take direct dictation. The first time. Those are not my words, Congressman. Those are the investigators' words. Right. Did you lie to Bob Mueller or are you lying to us? I didn't lie. Okay. You're not really here to tell the truth. You are here to participate in a continuing cover-up. Russia interfered with this election in sweeping and systematic fashion. The Trump campaign welcomed that assistance at the highest level. There were subsequent acts of obstruction of justice with respect to the investigation. The American people deserve to Chairman. know the truth. Mr. Chairman, the gentleman yields back. The gentleman, the gentleman I think I was 19 seconds over to help you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Lewandowski, my, my colleague, Mr. Jeffries, just started that last line of questioning with a, a sort of an admonition to you. He said, this is the House Judiciary Committee and not a political forum, and it would be nice if you recognize that. I think it'd be nice if all the members of this committee would recognize that, because that's the reason that this has turned into such a farce. It's been said so many times today, this committee is so important to the country. It has one of the broadest jurisdictions over so many critical issues that are facing the country. You referenced some of this in your opening statement. And I, among many of my colleagues, are ready to get to that work for the American people. But we're here today. There hasn't been any fireworks. Oh, there's a lot of disappointed people around operatives around the country who are really hoping that there'd be fireworks, but we're not surprised at all. I have a couple of questions just for clarification for the record, but, but first, is there anything that's been said here, any question that you've been asked about or something that you would like to provide further comment on, just to clarify the record? No, sir. All right, in questioning today, is the majority investigating any new allegation or issue or fact not already investigated by the House and Senate Intel Committees or the Special Counsel's Office? Not to the best of my knowledge. Do you have any more information on any other matter related to either collusion or obstruction that you can offer to this committee that you have not already shared with Congress or the special counsel's office? I don't believe I have any new information. In your prior testimony to the special counsel, is it true that you answered every question asked of you truthfully and to the best of your ability and your recollection? To the best of my recollection, I did answer truthfully, yes. Uh, a couple of things just... For, for further clarification, um, we're afraid that some of this record will be obscured today. So let me just, these will just be quick rapid fire. Do you agree there is no evidence the president intended to obstruct justice? I do. Do you agree that the president has been harassed politically since the day he took office? Yes, I do. Do you agree that the president's supporters have received vastly different treatment than the supporters of Hillary Clinton? Unequivocally. You've called this a witch hunt. And I wonder if you'd like to elaborate on that uh, in, any further. I think, this, I think that this fake Russia collusion narrative is the greatest crime committed against the American people and our generation, if not ever. This is a president who was duly elected by the American people, and members of certain bodies refused to accept those election results. If this were done by a different president to a different party, the same way it was done to Donald Trump, that person would already be thrown out of office and people would be in jail. But when you support Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, there's a different set of rules. I think the American people find it very unfair, and there's been no accountability at the highest levels of the government for the Pfizer abuse applications which transpired, the spying on Americans clearly in violation of the Fourth Amendment, or the lives that were ruined because they simply wanted to support a candidate for President of the United States, and I think it's shameful. 
We do as well, and that's a pretty good recitation of some of the issues that are keeping us up at night. Part of the thing that we're greatly concerned about is the American people's uh, distrust now of our institutions. When, when people begin to doubt that the rule of law actually applies equally, that justice really is blind in this country, then we, we reach somewhat of a tipping point. It's very difficult to put that genie back in the bottle, and we're, we're concerned. I know the Republicans and the conservatives on this committee are deeply concerned about the eroding faith in our institutions. I'm, I'm thankful that you've come to take the hostile fire today. I commend you for that. I commend you for your, uh, your story being self-made. And I'm, one of the things I'm also concerned about is young people who are watching this who may have a disincentive to get into politics and to serve their country in this way because of this abuse that they've, uh, they've suffered. I yield to Mr. Jordan. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, real quick, Mr. Lewandowski, you know why you didn't get a defensive briefing from the FBI? I do not. I got a good idea. I think they were trying to trap the president. Page 17 of the Inspector General's report points this out. January 6, 2017, they go up to the Trump Tower when it's President-elect Trump, and they're trying to set him up about a pending investigation. All the while, Mr. Comey's been telling the president, you're not under investigation. Of course, they didn't give you a defensive briefing during the campaign or even when he, up until that date, because they were trying to set him up. But we can't ask about that because Mr. Nadler hasn't even thought about when he's going to bring Mr. Horowitz in to answer our questions. He'd rather see it, subpoena you even though you're willing to come voluntarily. That's the problem. I thank the gentleman for his good line of question. Thank him for yielding. I yield back. Thank the gentleman from Ohio and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The uh, gentleman from Rhode Island. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewandowski, uh, in between your first meeting on June 19th and your second meeting with the President on July 19th, you went on vacation, and also during that time there was public reporting about the Trump Tower meeting, correct? This is on page 92. If it's in the report, I believe it to be accurate. And on July 19th, when the President, for a second time, asked you to deliver the message to Sessions, you said, and I quote, the message would be delivered soon, page 93. Correct? Page 93. But you didn't. You didn't call Jeff Sessions. You didn't try to meet with him. So the president asked you twice in the Oval Office to deliver a secret message to the Attorney General of the United States, a message that you quickly wrote down word for word at the president's direction, correct? Sir? I believe I wrote it down. Yeah. And when you worked for the president during his campaign, did you ever ignore or disobey directions from candidate Trump? Uh, I didn't believe it to be uh, in order. Just to be clear, although you were not working for the president in any capacity, you wanted to give the president the impression that you were going to follow his orders, correct? No. Well, you said, I'm going to take care of it. Is that reference in the report? Did you tell the president you were going to deliver the message? I can't comment on private conversations okay, sir, with the president to preserve page... executive privilege. I'm sorry? I can read you the exact statement again if you'd like me well, to. I said the White House has directed that I not disclose well, the substance the of any Oval discussion Office, with the president or his advisors to protect executive time, branch confidentiality. You're not going to stonewall me in my questioning. Would you like your me to answer your question? Your head must spinning. In, you're here in the, with the president of the United States in the Oval Office. He's directing you to deliver a message to the chief law and office, enforcement officer in the United States which you understood would effectively end the ongoing investigation into this president and his campaign. So you told the president that the message would be delivered soon. But then, this is on page 93, you immediately following the meeting with the president, you gave Dearborn the message. The president had dictated to be delivered to Sessions, correct? I believe that's what the report says. And you didn't tell the president that you'd already asked Dearborn to deliver the message. You just said it would be delivered soon. This is on page 92, correct? It's, it's on page 92. You didn't want to tell the president that you were passing off his message to someone else, did you? You knew he wanted you, someone he had described as his enforcer, a loyal soldier, to do it because the president trusted you. Isn't that right? That's a question for the president, sir. Then, well, why didn't you then deliver the message to Mr. Dearborn, uh, to uh, Jeff Sessions directly? Why did you give it to Mr. Dearborn to do? I think I've testified I was out of town. For two weeks. That's, I don't live in town, okay. Congressman. You, unlike Lewandowski, you, unlike you, sir, I don't okay. live in town. Do you, during your second meeting in the Oval Office, the president told you that if Sessions wouldn't meet with you, to tell him he was fired. Did you, Mr. Lewandowski, ever threaten the Attorney General that if he didn't meet with you, he would be fired? No. Did you tell Mr. Dearborn to tell Sessions that he would be fired if he didn't take this meeting as the president directed? 
Congressman, the White House has directed and not disclose the substance of any discussion with the president or his advisors to protect executive branch confidentiality. The reason you didn't tell the president that was because you know that it was wrong. And the president, isn't that correct? No. Well, the president wasn't aware that you ignored his directive to tell Jeff Sessions he was fired if he didn't meet with you, was he? I'm sorry, what was the question? I'll move on. In fact, to prove to the attorney general that the threat was real, Four days later, on July 22nd, the president directed Priebus, his chief of staff, to obtain Sessions' resignation. That's on the slide in front of you. The president told Priebus that he had to get Sessions to resign immediately. Did you know that? No. This evidence as a whole strongly suggests that the president was reinforcing to Sessions that his job was on the line at the same time as the president believed you were delivering the message to end the investigation into the 2016 campaign. And all of this made everyone very uncomfortable, including Mr. Dearborn, which is at page 93. And he told you uh, that he was uncomfortable being a, message, a messenger to Sessions, correct? No. Well, were you aware when you asked Rick Dearborn to deliver this message to the Attorney General on behalf of the President of the United States, it created the same legal culpability for you as that you delivered the message yourself? Are you, are you aware of that? Congressman, the President didn't ask me anything illegal and he never asked me to keep anything a secret. Are you aware that when you asked Mr. Dearborn to deliver this message to end the investigation and just focus on future investigations, you thought you were protecting yourself, but you were in fact committing a crime. Rick Dearborn knew delivering the message was wrong, you knew it was wrong, that's why even after being asked to deliver it and saying you'd handle it soon, you passed it off to him and you never followed up. And guess what? I also think it's very, very wrong. In fact, I think the president asking a private citizen to try to scare his attorney general into ending the investigation into the president's conduct is obstruction of justice, plain and simple. The I yield back. The gentleman has expired. The witness may answer the question. I don't believe there was a question. Very well. The uh, gentleman, from, uh, gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewandowski, thank you for being here today. You've come voluntarily. You know, you've uh, heard uh, slanderous attacks on you. You've had people refer to you as a gutted fish. You've had people re refer to you as a chicken. You've had people imply that you're here to lie. Um, that's unfortunate. And it's, it's beneath this committee, quite frankly. We're here. Ostensibly, they tell me that they want to they want to hear the truth. You're here to tell the truth today, right, Mr. Lewandowski? Yes, sir. And in fact, you've given lots of testimony. You've told the truth repeatedly. I see I see a list of 302s when you were talking to the FBI, right? Yes, sir. And the, the, those 302s, they didn't record that. Those are afterward after notes, right? I believe that's right. You gave testimony. Uh, to, to the intelligence committees of both houses, right? I did, yes. Yeah. And so here you sit here today, and, and you gave testimony to, and you gave interviews, I think <laughs> roughly 20 hours worth of interviews to the Mueller team, right? Yes, sir. And if we look at this Mueller report, we see your name in various places throughout the Mueller report, right? Fair enough? I've never read the report, but I think that's accurate, sir. You're, you're not unwise to not have read the report. Nobody's actually read the report, but that's okay. Yeah, I've read the report. Yeah. You're the one. We've been looking for you. Yeah, I'm the <laughs> one. And, and your name is all over this report. But oddly enough, when you were asked by uh, a member of the other side to look at volume two, page 86, and they wanted you to testify to it, you might be surprised. Your name's not even mentioned on that page. You know that? You're, 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 you're not even mentioned there. They were asking you questions to comment about things where your name's not even there. Did you know that? No, sir. That same person then asked you to talk about page 4950, volume two. Guess what? Guess whose names don't appear there? Yours. Did you know that? No, I did not. Yeah, it's odd, isn't it? Odd, isn't it, that they would be asking you to comment on pages that you weren't even there. So let's... Let's talk a little bit more about some of what members of Congress have, have done. They've, they've spent two years claiming without evidence that then-candidate Trump and the Trump campaign colluded with Russia. As a member of the campaign, you've responded today. How do you respond? Would you like to expand on that again today? Uh, during my tenure at the campaign, Congressman, as I said in my opening statement, never do I believe I had any interaction with any foreign agents, foreign agencies, or foreign governments who were attempting to 
impact the outcome of the election. I've said very publicly, if anybody did attempt to impact the outcome of the election in a legal manner, I hope they spend the rest of their lives in jail. Yeah, and so we know that on January 2019, on the Chris Matthews Show, a member of this committee was asked, do you believe the president right now has been an agent of the Russians? That was me. That member said, yes. Chris, Ma Chris Matthews followed up and said, an agent like in the 1940s working for a foreign power? That individual responded, he's working on behalf of the Russians, yes. Still believe that. And, you know, Mr. Chairman. Are we, are we, the, ge the gentleman from... Uh Arizona's got the time. Arizona has the time. I'd like my. T I'd like. I'd like ten seconds added back on. He's got ten interrupt. seconds in any event. So, so as a close friend, personal, and advisor of the president, member of the Trump campaign, how do you respond to that accusation by a member of this committee, made months and months ago, even before the Mueller report came out and said there was no collusion or, or con uh, con coordination? You know, Congressman, I find it beneath the dignity of the President of the United States to accuse somebody of that. And while I didn't support President Obama when he was the President didn't vote for him, I still wanted my country to be successful, so I wanted him to be successful. And I think those faceless, baseless accusations against our President are unfounded and unwarranted. So I want to just cover the last little bit of this. We hear today uh, lots of questions about a, a, a meeting you had with the President regarding Jeff Sessions and, and some note that was dictated to you. That was after Special Counsel Mueller was appointed, wasn't it? I believe it was, yes. Did, Mr. Did the President ask you to stop Mr. Mueller or to encourage Mr. Sessions to stop the Mueller investigation at any point? President, I can't, uh, Congressman, I can't speak to uh, or disclose the substance of discussions with the president or his advisors to protect the executive branch confidentiality. I appreciate that, but I will tell you, in going through this report, there is no in evidence, no indicia that the president ever asked that you or Mr. Sessions stop the Mueller investigation. In fact, the Mueller investigation went on unimpeded. Thousands of interviews, millions of documents, and with that, my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back, uh, the gentleman from uh, California. Mr. Lewandowski, I'm gonna put a slide up, and it's the words that President Trump dictated to you on July 19. Can you read what you wrote down? I'm happy to have you read it, Congressman. Well, why don't you wanna read it, Mr. Lewandowski? I think you should afford me the same privilege you afforded Director Mueller. Would you like to read it? No, you're welcome to read it. Are you ashamed of the words that you wrote down? President Swalwell, I'm very happy of what I've written, but you're welcome to read it if you'd like. Are you, are you ashamed to read it out loud? I'm not ashamed of anything in my life, Congressman, are you? Then why don't you read the words? Congressman, I've asked and answered your Mr. question. Lewandowski, why won't you read the words aloud? I've asked and answered your question, Congressman. If you'd like to read the words, you're welcome to. Well, you were ashamed to read them out loud and you didn't deliver those words to the person the president asked you to. Did you have a consciousness of guilt? I have nothing to be guilty of, Congressman. Thank you. You still feel guilty today, and that's why you can't read it out loud? Congressman, you're welcome to read the words if you'd like. Well, I just wonder why you can't. I have the capacity well, to, Congressman. I'll give you the privilege. You said the president did nothing wrong. Why can't you read those words right now? Why can't you read them aloud? Congressman, tell me why you hold me to a different standard than the previous witnesses who sat here. I want, I want to give you one more opportunity to clear up something you said earlier. You've said a number of times it was in the Mueller report it was accurate, except as it relates to you stating that this was the only time the president ever asked you to write something down. Are you saying that that part's not accurate? And I'd ask to stop the clock while he confers with his lawyer. The clock will be stopped for five seconds. Could I see the page and reference number on that, Congressman? Sure, it's page 91, lines seven and eight. I will read it to you. This was the first time the president had asked Lewandowski to take dictation. Are you saying that that is not accurate? I'm saying those aren't my words, Congressman. I'm asking you, was that the first time the president asked you to take dictation? And I've testified it's not the first time. So this part would be inaccurate? I'm saying I've taken dictation by the candidate and the president in the past. Have you ever put any words that the, res the president asked you to write down before in a safe? Or was this the first time you'd done that? Uh, I believe it's my standard operating procedure when taking notes, Congressman. So every note that you take of the president, you put in a safe? 
How big is that I safe? I don't, it's a big safe, Congress. There's a lot of guns in there. Is this the first time you've ever put a secret message from the president that he wanted you to deliver to someone else in the safe? I don't believe there's anything secret about the message. I was never told to keep the message secret. Is this the first time you ever put a message that the president asked you to deliver to someone else in the safe? Not to the best of my recollection. I want to go back to that day. Later, after the president asked you to deliver this message, he was interviewed by the New York Times. And the next slide shows that he said, Sessions should have never recused himself. And if he was going to recuse himself, he should have told me before he took the job, I would have picked someone else. That's not what the president said to you during that meeting one-on-one -on -one in the Oval Office. Is that right? The White House has directed that I not disclose the substance of any discussions with the president or his advisors Mr. to protect Chairman, executive branch Mr. confidentiality. Chairman, I'd, like to, I'd like to stop the clock for a parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman will state his parliamentary inquiry. I would like to stop. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to request a ruling on the witness's refusal to answer. Mr. Lewandowski, when you refuse to answer these questions, you are obstructing the work of our committee, but you are also proving our point for the American people to see. The president is intent on obstructing our legitimate oversight. You are aiding him in that obstruction. And I will remind you that Article 3 of the impeachment against President Nixon was based on obstruction of Congress. You are instructed to answer the question. The clock will start again. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry. Gentlemen, the clock will stop again. State, the gentleman will state his parliamentary is, inquiry. Is it correct, and I can repeat, or you could let me see your little sheet there, that that uh, reference you made to Nixon was after a formal inquiry was put to the House and then brought back to the Judiciary Committee. Your statement's a little bit different than this. Just wanted to point out truth for the record. I yield back. I have a parliamentary and, inquiry, Mr. Chairman. First of all, that was not a parliamentary inquiry. He didn't even ask anything. But uh, who, who seeks? The gentleman will state his parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Chairman, did, did you just threaten to impeach Mr. Lewandowski, a private citizen? No, and the plain import of, my, of what I said was that he is violating the law by refusing to answer these questions. The president is violating the law by instructing him and others not to answer these questions. And Article 3 of the Nixon impeachment uh, was based on this kind of obstruction of Congress by President Nixon. One further the inquiry, Mr. Chairman? General will state his parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, so does that mean then, pursuant to your statement, that this is an official impeachment that we're in? I have stated repeatedly that this committee is, uh, and, and we amended our rules to, to empower the chairman to designate specific hearings, which I did for this hearing, is pursuant to finding out, to, to, to determining whether we should vote articles of impeachment against the president. That's exactly what this is. Thank you. The gentleman from California will, con is, will continue. Mr. Lewandowski, I'll ask you again, this, What's displayed on the slide is not what the president told you in that one-on-one -on -one meeting. Is that correct? Are you refusing to answer, Mr. Lewandowski? No, Congressman. As I've explained in a letter from the White House dated September 16, 2019, Mr. to my attorney, Mr. Lewandowski, that Mr. Lewandowski's conversation with the answer. president so, and with senior advisors to the president protected from disclosure. Stop the clock again for this obstructive behavior. Mr. Chairman, point of order, and I'd ask the clock be stopped. The clock will be stopped. And Mr. The Chairman, I'd ask that this... The gentleman... Oh, excuse me. The gentleman will state his point of order. My point of order is, Mr. Chairman, this witness continues to obstruct the work of this committee by refusing to answer questions. He's been ordered to do so by you. I ask that you would judge him in contempt in these proceedings. Point of order. That's not a proper parliamentary inquiry. It was a point of order. Will, it wasn't a parliamentary take, will, inquiry. Excuse me. I will take that under advisement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen will continue. Are you refusing to answer, yes or no? And I, I don't you Congressman, I'm happy to answer your question, so let me have the privilege to do so. As explained below, Mr. Lewandowski's conversations with the president and with senior advisors to the president are protected from disclosure by long set of principles again, protecting Mr. executive Lewandowski, branch confidentiality. Mr. Chairman, as a that's, result, that's the White answer. House is directing Mr. Lewandowski not to provide information about such communications I, I beyond the information provided in the portions stop. of the report that have already been disclosed to the committee. The gentleman has the time, not the witness. And, and Mr. Lewandowski, I'm just asking, if you're not going to answer, just say it's a refusal to answer. We don't need to be read the instructions from the White House. So I'm going to move on. In that New York Times interview, hours after the president spoke to you, he never said 
In fact, I just enlisted Mr. Lewandowski to deliver a secret message to the Attorney General for him to direct the special counsel to limit the investigation. He said to you something that he did not say just hours publicly. Is that right? I have no idea what he said to the New York Times. Mr. Lewandowski, would you agree that delivering a secret message in the way that this president did as a former law enforcement officer who's probably investigated gangs and mob-like behavior, that this is consistent with that? I take exception to your premise of the question. It was a secret message. Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Lewandowski, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, you, know, you, you, you and the president are accused by the majority of uh, a cover-up of foreign collusion, but the uh, Mueller team of partisans, try though they did, couldn't find any evidence of collusion. So since you stand accused of this crime, I'm just kind of curious, how do you cover up a crime that never happened? It's a great question, Congressman. I don't know the answer. You've been uh, watching the crux of the majority's case. It's that the president asked you to suggest to the attorney general that he should say the president is being treated unfairly and had done nothing wrong. Is that essentially the uh, accusation against you? It seems to be, yes, sir. Well, I think the record's pretty clear. The president was being treated unfairly and he had done nothing wrong. Yet it's upon this pretext that the Democrats feel justified to invoke impeachment. The, the solemn power reserved to the uh, Congress for treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. That's the power to nullify the constitutional election of the President of the United States, a decision made by the American people. D does that sound like an abuse of power in this case to you? It does. It certainly does to me, too. For, for more than three years now, our, our nation has been torn apart by this monstrous lie that the President of the United States was a willing agent of a hostile foreign power. I'd like to ask you, where do you think this whole lie of Russian collusion started? You know, Congressman, I don't have the facts on it, but I think uh, when Inspector General Horowitz has the privilege of coming here and testifying, he'll testify that this began at the highest levels of the government and was perpetrated through the intelligence community to come up with a narrative of why Hillary Clinton lost the campaign as opposed to the real narrative of why Donald Trump won the campaign. Well, this actually began before the election. Do you, do you believe the U.S. government, through its justice and intelligence agencies, uh, deliberately interfered with the 2016 presidential election? I believe there are members of the intelligence community uh, who have been referred for criminal referral for perjury and other crimes. Um, should be held accountable for using their badges and their guns to try and influence the election and spy on American citizens in a clear violation of the Fourth Amendment and falsifying FISA applications for the explicit purpose of trying to prevent an individual from being elected President of the United States. If we're serious about protecting the American political process from unwarranted interference, either by foreign governments or by our own government, where should we be looking? I would recommend uh, Inspector General Horowitz, uh, U.S. Attorney Durham, who's in the middle of an investigation. I would also, if it were me and I were the chairman, or maybe someday in the upper chamber, we'll bring before us James Comey, Clapper, and Brennan, and have them answer the questions under oath that seems to elude them so many times when they sit before these committees. Oh, by the way, we have suggested to the majority that we need to do precisely that, and so far all of those requests have fallen on deaf ears. But here's the picture that seems to be slowly taking shape as more and more information comes to light. We have a phony dossier produced by the Clinton campaign, and we have disinformation channeled to uh, George Papadopoulos through Joseph Mifsud, who it turns out has a long history uh, of involvement with Western intelligence agencies, including the CIA. That was then used to justify a sham investigation. That investigation was then leaked to the press to give credence to this false narrative. Um, is, is, is that what you see taking shape here with the evidence that's slowly coming out? I, I think that's exactly right. And you look at the role that Bruce Orr and his wife Nellie Orr played at Fusion GPS, the culpability they have, the fact that uh, they at least notified the FBI of the lack of credibility of Christopher Steele and the information that he was providing uh, should give us great pause that such a small group of individuals at the FBI who comprised Crossfire Hurricane had the opportunity to set in motion a plan to try and prevent a person from being elected President of the United States with no evidence whatsoever. 
I, I think the importance of this cannot be overstated. We entrust the most terrifying powers that the government possesses to these agencies, the, the, literally the power to ruin lives, to, to spy on you, uh, to incarcerate you, uh, to launch uh, pre-dawn raids on your home. The abuse of these powers for political purposes would be a direct threat to the most fundamental freedoms that we have as Americans and the most fundamental institutions of our democracy. I should think that that would be of some passing interest to every member of this committee. I'll set Yield back. All done. Gentleman yields, uh, yields back. The uh, gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Lewandowski, earlier in your testimony, you questioned the love that Democrats have for our country. I served on active duty in the United States military. Do not question my love of our country. I'm not going to question yours. We are all Americans. Now, earlier in your testimony, you had made a pretty stunning concession, which is that you had not read the Mueller report. That explains a lot about your testimony. And I'm thinking maybe you don't know what the special counsel actually found. So I'm going to tell you. Volume one of the Mueller report found that the Russians attacked American elections in a sweeping and systematic manner. It also found that the Trump campaign knew about the attack, that they gave internal polling data to the Russians, that they planned their campaign strategy around this attack. It's not just in the Mueller report, it's also in Robert Mueller's testimony under oath in front of the Intel Committee, as well as this committee. The reason we are here today is because Volume 2 finds that the president tried to obstruct that investigation into the Russian attack on at least 10 instances, five of which Robert Mueller found there was substantial evidence. So I'm going to put up a slide about what uh, the special counsel found about this particular incident in which you're involved. He found substantial evidence that the president's effort to have Sessions limit the scope of the special counsel's investigation to future election interference was intended to prevent further investigative scrutiny of the president's and his campaign's conduct. So that's why we're all here today. And I think it's important to look at the timeline to understand how this all unfolded. You previously testified that in March 2017 uh, that you were aware that Attorney General Sessions recused himself. He did that in March 2017. I'm going to put up a slide about what the White House Counsel's Office uh, had directed about communications with Sessions. It said that Sessions should not be contacted, no contact with Sessions, and no com serious concerns about that instruction. Uh, did you ever get that instruction from anyone uh, not to contact Sessions at all? Clock is stopped. No. Okay, thank you. A few months later, on June 14, 2017, the media reports that the obstruction investigation well, actually, that the Russian investigation turns into obstruction investigation into the president himself. And then when Donald Trump learns about this, he goes nuts. Isn't that correct? I don't know that to be accurate. I, the president launched over 10 tweets very shortly thereafter calling the investigation a witch hunt. That's correct, isn't it? I don't know that to be accurate. He did. All right, so then uh, he calls Don McGahn at home and says that Mueller has to go, call me back when you do it. Were you aware of that, that he called Don McGahn at home to tell him to fire Mueller? No. Okay. Uh, two days after that phone call, the president calls you, uh, into his office. You admitted that he dictated uh, a message for you to carry to uh, Jeff Sessions. You said that you didn't give it to Jeff Sessions because you went on vacation. Uh, the Mueller report... Uh, Ashley says that the Attorney General canceled that meeting. Uh, that's correct, isn't it? The Attorney General, in fact, canceled the meeting that you tried to give the uh, note to? Uh, I don't, you, where is that reference in the report, Congressman? Sure, it's on page 92. Um, I'm going to give you the courtesy. I'm just going to read it for you. It says, um, Lewandowski called Sessions and arranged a meeting for the following evening at Lewandowski's office, but Sessions had to cancel due to a last minute conflict. Uh, you do you remember that? I believe that's accurate. Okay, all right. And then a little bit later on July 8th, uh, the media writes uh, additional negative information about the president and his campaign, including uh, that uh, his senior advisors and his son met with Russian operatives who had dirt on Hillary Clinton as part of Russia and its government's support for Mr. Trump. Uh, Donald Trump then calls you back into uh, his office again alone for a meeting. And this time, uh, he tells you that uh, 
Sessions is going to be fired if he doesn't meet with you. Do you recall that conversation? Yeah, I, I took that as a joke. Okay, you took that as a joke. After that, the president goes on TV and he says, Sessions should have never recused himself, and if he was going to recuse himself, he should have told me before he took the job and I would have picked somebody else. Do you think the president was joking when he said that on TV? I don't know if the president was joking or not. When the president met with you alone to ask if you delivered the uh, note to Sessions, do you believe any of that was a joke? I, I can't discuss a private conversation with the president that isn't in the report, sir. Okay. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from uh, Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Lewandowski, for being here today. Uh, voluntarily. You know, first we had the Steele dossier, which turned out to be a false opposition report funded by the Clinton campaign and the Democrat National Committee, and apparently was used to spy on uh, the Trump campaign and initiate the special counsel investigation. Then for two years, we've heard from Democrats on TV, I heard it over and over again from some on this committee, that they had proof, proof, that the president had colluded with Russia. But then guess what? The Mueller report comes out and they lied. It was totally false. There was no collusion, no conspiracy. So then, then my Democratic colleagues had to, had to switch gears because they knew that one failed. So they said, oh, now it's obstruction of justice. So they brought in Robert Mueller and they tried to question him. They did everything they could. And that one flopped too. And so now here we are today. They're hauling you in and who knows who they're going to haul in next. They're trying everything and anything. And, you know, I just don't know when it's going to end. I want to read a quote from, on April 19, 2019, shortly after the release of the Mueller report, Emmett Flood, special counsel to the president, wrote about the abuses by executive branch employees. He said, in the partisan commotion surrounding the released report, it would be well to remember that what can be done to the president can be done to any one of us. Do you agree with this statement? I do. And Mr. Lewandowski, I have to tell you, I'm scared for our country. I'm scared when I read this Mueller report, when I read what's been going on with a, a false dossier that was apparently used to spy on Americans. And if that can be done to the President of the United States, this can be done to anyone. And so I ask you, Mr. Lewandowski, do you think that the Democrats will go to any length to undermine the President of the United States and influence the 2020 election? You know, Congresswoman, I believe in this democracy of the United States, and I love this country. And I think while partisan politics is so important, I think the fact that we're the greatest, freest country in the world is paramount to everything that we do. And while we may disagree uh, in this committee, and I believe that this president has been treated exceptionally unfairly, I think at the end of the day, we all believe that a free and fair election is the best way and the best method for ensuring the safe and security of our democracy. Uh, do I have concerns based on the 2016 election? seeing the abuses of a small minority that have impacted so many? You bet I do. Am I concerned that as our children and grandchildren grow up, we look back on this time in our nation's history and we say, that never should have been allowed, not to a Republican and never to a Democrat? You bet I do. But I think at the end of the day, partisan politics aside, and to Mr. Lou's point, we all love our country. We may have disagreements, but I don't think anybody wants to see someone not elected properly or the interference of foreign agents or individuals in this country
to negatively impact the outcome of an election because we are better than that. This country is the greatest country in the history of our planet, and we should never forget that. And sometimes, maybe just sometimes, partisan politics can take a backseat to doing what's right for our country. Thank you, Mr. Lewandowski, and I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Jordan. Uh, I thank the gentleman for yielding and thank the gentleman for his uh, well-stated answer to the last question. So, uh, Mr. Lewandowski, the Obama administration spied on two American citizens associated with the campaign that you ran and were involved with, George Papadopoulos and Carter Page. We've heard from Mr. McClintock, Ms. Lesko, about Carter Page and the dossier and how they did that. With Mr. Papadopoulos, it was done overseas with foreigners. FBI spies on a major party's nominee for the highest office in the land spies on two American citizens. Just for the record, were you as the campaign manager ever notified, or was anyone at the campaign ever notified that that was going on when it was happening? No, sir. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman who's gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Mr. Chairman, some of our GOP colleagues have suggested that our time would be better spent today working on protecting the 2020 election. So we must charitably assume that they've just completely forgotten about the House of Representatives passing on June 27, 2019, the Securing America's Federal Elections Act, which authorizes $600 million to modernize and secure our election infrastructure, mandates the use of voter-verified paper ballots and post-election risk-limiting audits, and bans internet accessibility and connectivity for devices on which ballots are marked or counted. Now, perhaps they forgot about it because all of them voted against it, except for one Republican, and the entire Democratic caucus voted to support it. We are still hoping that Mitch McConnell decides to take up that legislation. So who are the useful idiots? I suppose we can have an interesting conversation about that later. Mr. Lewandowski, you told Mr. McClintock some of the things you might want to investigate uh, about the deep state uh, when you become a U.S. Senator. Let me ask you something else about your upcoming service as a Senator. Uh, will you accept this view of the so-called confidentiality interest pr executive privilege which you have been invoking today on behalf of the president's ability to prevent Congress from collecting testimony from private citizens. Will you accept that in your service if you are elected to the Senate? You know, Congressman, I appreciate your confidence in my ability to win in New Hampshire, and I'm sure many people in New Hampshire have that same confidence in me. Well, that I was being just said, on your representation to the answer. Well, I appreciate that, that. Thank you. But that being said, um, it's not my privilege to waive, Congressman. It's the executive office's privilege. Oh. And I'm not an attorney. Well, and so I can't I am one. To... So let me ask you a question. Are you representing the White House has told you that they are that they are invoking the executive privilege on your behalf today? I don't believe it's an executive privilege, sir. And, and again, I think we've submitted the letter for your clarification of what the White House has said. Well, let me ask but you. it's I'm, not I'm my really, privilege I'm, to waive. Well, I don't think it's anyone's privilege to waive because I don't think it exists, Mr. Lewandowski. I think the whole thing is imaginary. It's like the tooth fairy. Um, you didn't work My for the president are in the thank White you, House. Congressman. I'm sorry? My I, I children hope... were watching, so thank you for that. Well, I hope the president's not on then. Uh, Mr. Lewandowski, um, you didn't work for President Trump, did you? You never worked in the White House. I never worked in the White House, sir. Okay, so you were a private citizen when you met with the president uh, in, in the circumstances we're discussing today? Yes, I am. Okay, um, the White House says you shouldn't have to answer any questions today because the president's communication seeking advice or information in connection with the discharge of his duties are highly confidential. And this pushes White House obstructionism to a surreal new extreme. Let's make this clear, because I see no evidence at all that the president was seeking your advice or that you were helping him discharge his official duties. First of all, I just want to make sure we have this on the record. When you went to the White House in June and July of 2017 to meet with the president, you were not a White House employee, were you? I was not a White House and employee. You've never been a White House employee. That's correct. And there were no other White House employees present for that meeting, no secretary, no staff assistant, no other executive branch employee. Is that right? I believe that's accurate. Okay. And while you claim that you were advising him during those meetings, the president didn't seem to be seeking your advice at all. In fact, you never testified to the special counsel that President Trump once asked for your advice. Here's what you told the special counsel about your meeting on page 91, volume 2, and please put it up on the slide if you would. 
During the June 19 meeting, Lewandowski recalled that after some small talk, the president brought up Sessions and criti criticized his recusal from the Russia investigation. The president told Lewandowski that Sessions was weak and that if the president had known about the likelihood of recusal in advance, he would not have appointed Sessions. The president then asked Lewandowski to deliver a message to Sessions and said, write this down. So, I'm assuming you told the truth and the whole truth about your discussion when you testified to the special counsel. Um, there's nothing in there about him asking your advice on anything, is there? There's nothing in the report that says that, Nat. And, and you were not helping him perform his official duties in office, were you? I, I can't discuss my private conversation. Well, I'm just going based on what's up on the screen. Did you help him implement any of his duties of office at that point? Again, I can't discuss the substance of the discussion outside what's in the report. Well, um, no one has told us what duty you, you were performing, if you were performing one, or what public policy you were advising on. All of America is reading the same text. We don't see him asking you for your advice about anything. Did he ask your advice about anything? Did he ask your advice about national security, for example, which is the only context I know about an executive privilege, but now it seems as if that's not even being waved around. Look, one can only regard with amazement the logic of this argument. The president tweets out that various Fox News anchors advise him. Are they covered by this privilege too? The gentleman's time has expired. The witness may answer the question. That'd be a question that you should direct to the White House here, sir. The gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Virginia? Gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank Mr. Lewandowski for being here today after testifying three other times. Uh, willingly for you to be here, again, voluntarily. I, I doubt the others had as much political theater as uh, this one has had, but I appreciate you being here today. Uh, this hearing is yet another grand display of political theater that we have seen from this committee over the last several months. Uh, the majority should be focused on sound congressional oversight, in particular uh, the IG report about abuse in the FBI. Uh, and we should be having a hearing here soon with the Inspector General in front of us to question, but all we've seen for months uh, is desperate attempts to keep this impeach at all costs narrative, narrative alive. I don't know what they're calling it today. Is it an inquiry? Is it an investigation? Is it a proceeding? Uh, whatever word that Google thesaurus throws back at them when they type it in, that's what we're at. It's, uh, it's embarrassing uh, as a member of the Judiciary Committee to have you here to have to go through this, but uh, the majority is propping up this Mueller report uh, like a bad remake of Weekend at Bernie's. And its impeachment uh, based on the Mueller report is dead and everybody seems to know it except the chairman and several members of the party conference, the majority. Uh, we should be hearing from the IG report about the FBI abuse. Uh, we are now hearing about the president's mood uh, when he's talking to you in the Oval Office. Um, there was collusion with Russia, but not by President Trump. I want to go back to questions uh, by the gentleman from Florida, not the gentleman from Florida who's still standing by the belief, proven false by volume one of the Mueller report, that President Trump is a Russian, Russian agent. But the gentleman from Florida, or gentleman from California who is asking you about the Steele dossier, uh, you've heard of the Steele dossier, correct? Yes, sir. It was an opposition research document created by a man named Christopher Steele and paid for by the Clinton campaign and the DNC. Uh, have you ever met Christopher Steele? I have not. But you're familiar with who he is? I am. Christopher Steele was hired by a firm called Fusion GPS to produce the Steele dossier. Have you heard of Fusion GPS? Yes, I have. Well, that's one more than we had from uh, Mr. Mueller during his testimony because he didn't know what Fusion GPS was. Uh, do you know who hired Fusion GPS to produce the Steele dossier? I believe it was a law firm, Perkins Coy. And do you know who Christopher Steele's sources were for the information he put in the dossier? Uh, I don't have, uh, I couldn't speak to it directly, sir. But they were Russian sources, correct? That's the public reports, yes. And the FBI and intelligence leaders did not verify the truthfulness of the allegations in the Steele dossier about Donald Trump, did they? That's my understanding, sir. And even though the information was never verified, most of it has been proven to be false, the intelligence community relied on it to get a FISA application to spy on the Trump campaign, correct? I believe that's correct, yes. And all of this was laid bare in volume, or should have been laid bare, but uh, volume one clearly indicated that there was no collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. Um, that Mueller report that, that we are still uh, propping up 
uh, and, and hashing over week after week after week. Uh, you wrote an op-ed about back on March 29th when you uh, clarified that uh, you thought the report was comprehensive. Uh, you clarified that it found no wrongdoing by the president or his advisors, but that it is being used, it was being used back in March, uh, and it is still being used by conspiracy-minded Democrats and a hostile media for their own political purposes, thwarting the president's reelection and pursuing further investigations. Uh, do you stand by that op-ed, and do you still believe that it is being uh, misused in that way today? I do believe it, sir. Is there anything else you'd like to add to the questions that have been answered or asked? No, sir. All right. With that, I yield back. General yields back. The general lady from Washington. Thank you. Mr. Lewandowski, what we're seeing here is a pattern of the president doing anything and everything to hide his misconduct from Congress and from the American people. The president tried to get you to deliver a secret message to the attorney general all in an attempt to prevent the special counsel from exposing the president's own misconduct. And as soon as the special counsel published his report and the president's misconduct was exposed, the president tried to cover that up too. Isn't it true that the president has repeatedly tried to discredit your and other witnesses' testimony to the special counsel in the published report? Not to my knowledge. You follow the president on Twitter, Mr. Lewandowski? That's a good question. Okay. Uh, I'd have to check, but I think it's possible. I may be the only one who doesn't, but I'll fix that immediately. I'm sorry. Excellent. You've probably seen his tweets, I imagine. Didn't the president say, and I'll put up the slide for you, statements are made about me by certain people in the crazy Mueller report, in itself written by 18 angry Democrat Trump haters, which are fabricated and totally untrue. That is a Trump tweet from April 19th, 2019. That's the president saying that all the statements given by witnesses in the investigation, all those statements are untrue. Mr. Lewandowski, you were a witness in the investigation. You sat for interviews with the special counsel as part of the federal investigation. Isn't that correct? I did sit, yes. And the special counsel's report includes statements that you made to the special counsel during the federal investigation. Did you lie at any point to the special counsel during those interviews? Not to the best of my recollection, no. So your statements to the special counsel in the Mueller report, those are not, quote, fabricated and totally untrue. You didn't lie to the special counsel, did you, Mr. Lewandowski? Not to the best of my recollection, no. So the president is wrong that the report is fabricated and totally untrue. That's just the president trying to discredit all of the witnesses who said that he obstructed justice. Isn't that correct, Mr. Lewandowski? That's a question for the president. Well, which is it? I mean, did you lie, Mr. Lewandowski, or is the president wrong when he says that all of the statements in the report are fabricated? I think I believe it says certain people. Statements made about me by certain people. It doesn't say all, unless I'm misreading it. Mr. Lewandowski, uh, did you lie to the president, and is the president correct that everything in the report is fabricated? I won't comment on private conversations, but I don't appreciate the insinuation that I lied about anything. And well, I've answered I'm it multiple you. times. I'm I've answered your you. question multiple times about my truthfulness to the committee and the special counsel's office. And I office. appreciate that, Mr. Lewandowski. But I have not, to the best of my knowledge, should, lied to the special counsel. Mr. Lewandowski, counsel. this is my time. You are not yet in the Senate. You are a witness before the Judiciary Committee. Please act like it. This is my time. I control it. The president also said, and please put up this slide, watch out for the people that take so-called notes when the notes never existed until needed. Referring to the Mueller report, referencing people taking notes of meetings with the president, notes that documented the president's obstruction. Mr. Lewandowski, you had notes from your meeting with the president. You've testified to that before us, correct? Yes. You were dictated those notes by the president, correct? I believe that's in the report. And you told the special counsel, the president's dictated a message to you, and you said, write this down. This is volume 291, page 91. And you gave those notes to the special counsel, correct? I can't speak to the way the special counsel has conducted their investigation or Did what information the they have. Did you give the notes to the special counsel? This is not about how the special counsel conducted its investigation. That's a it's question about whether you gave the notes to the special counsel. That's a question for... Uh, Special Counsel Mueller. Uh, those were your notes, Mr. Lewandowski. They were in your safe. They were dictated to you and written down by you. Did you give them to the Special Counsel? 
I comply with all legal and lawful so requests of the special counsel. Obviously, you are once again obstructing our investigation by refusing to answer questions that... I've just answered are, your question. I said I comply with all requests by the special counsel. So you gave the notes to the special counsel? I've asked and answered your question. Did you make up that the president told you to write down that note, Mr. Lewandowski? I can't speak to private conversation of mine that I've had with the president of the United States. Did you lie about the president telling you to write down the note? I That's believe not a the, private conversation. I believe what is in the report is an accurate description. Okay. So to be clear, you also gave the special counsel notes from your meeting with the president that are not fabricated and totally untrue as per the president's tweet. So when the president said all those notes never existed until needed, that was his quote, that's just another instance of the president trying to discredit anyone who actually tried to document his misconduct. Now the president is going further, isn't he? You've said previously that you have nothing to hide and that you would answer all questions. Here's what you said. Can I play that clip? I never asked for presidential immunity whatsoever. Chris, I sat there for 12 hours and before I left, after the last four hours, I said, I will sit here for another four hours to answer every single one of your questions to the House Intelligence Committee. I said, before we leave today, I want to be very clear. I will sit and answer every one of your questions. There's no reason to subpoena me because I'm willing to volunteer if they want to ask me questions. I'll be happy to answer their questions because I have nothing to hide. It's interesting, Mr. Lewandowski, because obviously the president does have something to hide because the White House is directing you not to answer the questions in front of the Judiciary Committee. And that is a tremendously shameful thing, Mr. Lewandowski. The American people deserve to know the truth, and I think they deserve to have you answer our questions. Time of the uh, gentlelady has expired. The uh, gentleman from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <laughs> The, the American people know the truth if they've read the Mueller report and uh, have come to their own conclusions. Uh, you and, sir, you and uh, the Trump campaign fully cooperated with the Mueller investigation. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. And multiple times that you've been asked to testify voluntarily before numerous different congressional committees, you've complied in that request, even voluntarily not even needing to be subpoenaed. That's right, to the best of my recollection, yes. And after 22 months, 18 lawyers, 500 subpoenas, 500 search warrants, uh, the Mueller report concluded that there was no evidence that the Trump campaign colluded with Russia. Is that correct? Uh, I haven't read the report, but I believe that's the final conclusion. So um, this, uh, now that we've established that the Mueller report itself doesn't find that there's any collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia, this whole contention about the president firing or not firing or directing people to fire, is it your understanding, and you may not be able to answer this because it's outside the scope, but is it your understanding in Article 2 of the Constitution that the president could fire the attorney general without cause for any reason whatsoever? Let me preface it by saying I'm not an attorney, but it's my understanding that the president has broad authority over members who serve in the executive branch and has broad latitude to hire and fire at his discretion. And also under that constitutional authority um, obligated to him under Article 2, he could fire the FBI director without uh, reason for any reason whatsoever at any time. Again, I'm not an attorney, but that, that could be a very uh, realistic interpretation of the Article II powers that are provided to the President of the Constitution, yes. And he could have also had uh, Mr. Mueller fired during the course of the investigation if he wanted to under his powers under Article II. Uh, again, I think that would be a question for the Attorney General or White House Counsel, but I believe that would be his prerogative if he so chose, yes. So given all that, he did not choose to exercise any of that authority. In fact, he uh, allowed for the campaign and members like yourselves to coordinate with them, uh, cooperate with them, and until now that we've gone through a 22-month investigation where the American people have been sold a lie of Russian collusion, now we're going to just try to rehash this narrative amongst the American people, despite the fact that it has been investigated by investigators, lawyers, FBI agents for 22 months. Um, I would be happy to yield to any other members in my caucus that would like to yield. If not, I'll yield back to the chair. Thank you for your time. Gentleman yields back, the gentlelady from uh, Florida. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewandowski, just for the record, um, I do love this country. I spent 27 years uh, enforcing the law, and now I have the honor of writing uh, the law. 
Um, when special counsel visited us and in his testimony, he talked about a spectrum of witnesses who were either telling half-truths up to those who were outright liars. Uh, today, I do have to wonder how many untruths, how many members of Congress neglecting their duties and their oath, and how many White House attorneys does it take to protect one innocent president? Uh, Mr. Lewandowski, you started off your testimony, or during your opening statement, you talked about being a certified police officer in New Hampshire. Is that correct? Yes. Do you believe that police officers have a very tough job? I do. But even with all of the stuff that law enforcement officers have to put up with, uh, not only enforcing the law and patrolling their communities, but um, just working horrible hours, I'm sure you know about that. With all of that stuff, do you believe that law enforcement officers, when they engage in wrongdoing, that they should be held accountable? I do. Mr. Lewandowski, you said that if anyone were trying to coordinate with Russia, they should be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law. Is that correct? I, I believe, Congresswoman, I said if anybody attempted to impact the outcome of the election illegally, they should spend the rest of their lives in jail. So do you believe that a person coordinating with Russia uh, should not be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law? I think anybody who's attempting to impact the outcome of an election illegally, whether it's with Russia or any other foreign entity, should spend the rest of their life in jail. Mr. Lewandowski, I know you know, and I, I believe I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt that you care about uh, the special counsel's report concluding that Russia government interfered in the 2016 presidential election in a sweeping and systematic fashion. Do you agree with that conclusion? I believe Russia attempted to influence the election, yes. In fact, the report documents over 100 contacts between Russian nationals or those acting on their behalf and the Trump campaign or those advising then-candidate Trump. The report focused that those contacts with Russia included offers of assistance to the campaign, invitations for candidate Trump and Putin to meet in person. Mr. Lewandowski, you said you knew nothing about this. Uh, is that correct? I don't believe I had any conversation with any Russian or Russian contact. You knew nothing about them offering assistance to, uh, to the campaign at all? No, I don't believe okay. I have. You said that I, I never spoke to a Russian. I never contacted a Russian. I never coordinated with the Russian. I don't know anything about Russia, okay? I never spoke to them, and I was the campaign manager. Do you remember saying something similar to that? I think that's an accurate statement. You also said, and I quote, you had sole control over the campaign other than the candidate himself. I sat next to the candidate Trump for thousands of hours during the period of time. Would that be a pretty close to what you remember saying? Uh, it would depend on the time frame of the campaign we're speaking about. When you served as campaign manager of right. the Trump campaign? There, there, were, there were multiple periods of time from... Uh, would you say that you had consult, sole control over the campaign other than the candidate himself? Would that be... Not on the day I was fired, I didn't have sole control. Prior to that day? But again, not, again, not leading you know up what, to. There is nothing funny. Not leading up to that day, there is, Congresswoman. There is absolutely. Well, you asked me a question. I'm happy to give you an answer. If you don't like my answer, I could rephrase thing. it. Excuse me. I said, if you don't like my answer, I could rephrase it. But no, I don't think I had sole control of the campaign the day preceding my firing, or the day I was fired, or multiple days leading up to that. So if you have a specific so time let's, frame. Let's, let's forget the firing. The first month that you were the campaign manager, would you say that you had sole control over the campaign other than the candidate himself? Are you talking about in June of 2015? So you talked to then candidate Trump pretty much on a regular basis, right? You've established that you talked to him on a regular basis. Is that correct? Yes. And out of being the campaign manager, being very close to the candidate, the campaign has over 100 contacts with Russia, and you didn't know anything about that? That's correct. Did you That's ever ask— my knowledge. Did you ever ask the president if he knew uh, about his campaign's contacts with Russia after the reports came out that there were over 100 contacts? Did you ever ask him after that report, those reports came out? I'm sorry, did I ask who, Congresswoman? I missed that. Did you ask Trump 
if he had ever had, did he know that the campaign had regular contact with Russians after the report came out? After you heard that report, those reports, the did you ever time ask? Has expired, but the witness may answer. Congresswoman, I couldn't disclose a private conversation I may or may not have had with the president. Thank you, Madam Chair. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, the gentleman from Texas. California. I'm okay. from Nevada. No. Georgia. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, Mr. Lewandowski, I'm glad to hear that both of us share a deep love for this country and that both of us have a tremendous distaste this taste for any foreign agents may, that may want to interfere with our democracy in this country. Uh, I'm going to ask you if you're familiar with George Papadopoulos. I am. And you agree that he was a foreign policy advisor for the Trump administration as of April 27, 2016? Uh, to the campaign, Congressman. To the campaign, correct? To the campaign. Yes. Uh, as you know, George pled guilty to felony crimes, including lying to federal investigators. We've got his indictment up on the screen. And one of those things he pled guilty to was lying about how often he was communicating with Russians, with Russia, uh, when he was an advisor to the campaign. Correct? I don't know if that's what he pled guilty to, Your Honor, sir. Okay. It's in this slide. In fact, I'm quoting the Mueller report now. Throughout April 2016, Papa Douglas continued to correspond and meet with Russians and seek Russian contacts. And of course, that's up on volume one. Uh, page 87, the slide. Uh, the report also documents Papadopoulos trying to schedule then-candidate Trump to travel to Russia to meet with Putin. Is that correct? I, I don't know what's in the report, sir. Okay. The report also documents emails discussing this potential Russian trip, and I'll show them to you in case you've not read them, correct? You can put those up, please. On April 27th, the Trump campaign foreign policy advisor, Papadopoulos, again, sent you, sir, an email telling you that he had, quote, been receiving a lot of calls over the last months about Putin wanting to host uh, Trump and the team when the time was right. Do you know about that? If that's what's in the report. Volume 1, page 89. Okay, that's the first I've seen it. On June 1st, Papadopoulos forwarded you another email from a Russian official raising the possibility of meeting in Moscow, asking you if that was something that you wanted to move forward with. Is that accurate or not? I don't know. Volume 1, page 89. Slide, please. I see the report, sir. Okay. Um, so, I would say that this is just was not about you receiving information uh, co about coordinating potential meetings with Russia, but actually uh, you responded to Papadopoulos, telling him to connect, connect with Sam Clovis because he was going to be the running point man. Um, is that correct? Yeah, I believe that to be accurate. Okay. Did you tell Papadopoulos to stop communication with Russians? Uh, I don't believe I did. Okay. You actually encouraged that communication, correct, by referring him to a running point man, which is Mr. Clovis. Yes? No, Congressman. What I was attempting to do with uh, contact from Mr. Papadopoulos, who I had very limited interaction with, was to put him in touch with a staff person who could have a more articulate and thorough conversation. It wasn't, while I ran the day-to-day -day responsibility of the campaign, a thousand emails a day didn't allow me the privilege of responding in detail to each of them. Candidate Trump has said that you and he were communicating 10 to 12 to 14 hours a day, is that correct? I'm not sure if that's what the president said, sir. He did. Uh, did you at all mention to candidate Trump these communications that Russians were having with the campaign? Not to the best of my recollection. Did you communicate with the family about these communications that were going on? Not to the best of my recollection. You and I both have a distaste for foreign agents 
affecting our democratic process. Did you report these incidences to the FBI? I did not. Did you bring it up to anybody's attention? <laughs> Uh, I think just Mr. Clovis, because I, 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 I did not see uh, that outreach to me as an offer to interfere with the outcome of the election. What did you see it as? I saw an outreach from a potential foreign agent to a senior policy, to a policy advisor, and that's why I asked him to get in touch with Mr. Clovis. I mean, for the safety, just to be on the safe side, wouldn't you call the FBI and say, hey, these guys are calling us, please check it out? You know, I, I think in hindsight, hindsight, it's something hindsight. that Mr. Clovis probably should have done. So you got Russians hacking our elections, your campaign advisors talking, another campaign advisor about Russians interested in communicating with the campaign. I, 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 I'm, Congressman, I'm I don't believe I ever had a communication of any Russians trying to offer but to you interfere in the outcome of, of the election. But you did have knowledge, the, uh, sir, of, of people general. in your campaign communicating with Russians. The time of the gentleman has expired. The witness may answer the question. Yes, sir. Thank you. The uh, gentlelady from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, one of the things that has always sort of caught my attention was the fact that uh, campaign chairman Paul Manafort shared with the Russian operative, Mr. Kolemnik, the campaigns, and this is a quote from the report, strategy for winning Democratic votes in Midwestern states. That's in volume one, pages six and seven. And that he shared with the Russian operative internal polling data on the campaign. Now, did you have any knowledge that Mr. Pe Manafort was sharing internal polling data or the campaign's Midwest strategy with these Russian operatives. Did you know about that? I did not. So although um, it, it's been reported that you continued to advise the campaign um, even after you left and had an enduring presence, that was not something you were aware of. Correct. I was not aware. Well, I'm just interested, you know, all of us here, both Republicans and Democrats, have something in common. We've run for office, and we know a little bit how to do that. And one of the things that uh, I think we all know is that internal polling data is generally something that you don't share broadly. You use it to base your campaign. Would you say that's correct as a general rule? I think it's a good general rule. Yes, ma'am. So I... Um, I'm mystified why the manager of the Trump campaign would choose the one thing that would allow the Russians, who were, we already know from other evidence, trying to influence this campaign, information that would allow them to guide their efforts, this internal polling data. Do you have any insight into that, why that would happen? Uh, I don't know why Mr. Manafort would share that information. It seems to me that, do you know whether the Russians asked for it? I don't know. Don't know. It seems to me that um, of all the things in the report, and there are many troubling things, um, that the Russians, and, and it's clear that they were trying to elect Donald Trump president. Actually, Putin has said that publicly since then they received from the Trump campaign manager the internal polling data and the strategy to win in the Midwest with Democratic votes, not once, but repeatedly. At the same time, there were over 100 contacts between Russians and the campaign. Can't you understand that would raise some anxiety, those facts? It, just a point of clarification, Mr. Yes. Manafort was never the campaign manager. You're, are you saying he was not involved in the campaign? No, I'm saying he was not the campaign manager, just as a point of clarification. Uh, chairman, manager, a person in charge of the campaign for a period of time. Um, I, I just think that when you add it up, I, who would know about this other than Mr. Manafort? Can you tell us who else we need to call who would have the facts of this information? Well, we know where Mr. Manafort is, and he's currently available for questioning, I think, if you're looking for him. In addition to him, who Mr. Gates, potentially. 
Mr. Gates might know about who, who initiated, whether the Russians were asking for the polling data or whether it was the idea of the Trump yes. campaign itself to provide the polling data. That would be Mr. Gates would know that in addition to Mr. Manafort. Yes. Do you think that the president was advised of the day-to-day -day details of his campaign? Uh, I don't think the president was advised of the minutia of the day details, the day-to-day -day details of the campaign as probably most candidates are not advised of the day-to-day -day minutia. What kind of, what level of information was the president generally provided? What, would it be, um, you know, we've got a strategy to win the Midwest or we're just hoping for the best? What would be the level of information generally that the president as a candidate would receive? Uh, I can only speak to my tenure there and my conversation with the candidate at the time about the information I would have shared. I would have uh, basically shared his travel calendar for the next day or week so he'd understand where we were traveling to. Uh, I would share with him media opportunities if he wanted to be on a, or have the opportunity to be on a specific television show. And then messaging points of what we may want to be discussing during that tenure or time of the campaign, and, particularly and I would if we're gonna be in a primary And I would state. assume, like all other campaigns, that the messaging was informed by the polling data that you had. Oh, well, just as a point of clarification, Congresswoman, we didn't do any polling data uh, for the first approximately 15 months of the campaign. My, my, my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The gentlelady from uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lewandowski, one of the major concerns raised by the special counsel's report is that the president has had a pattern of witness tampering conduct. So let's look at some facts. We know that Attorney General Sessions was a witness in the special counsel's investigation because of his role on Trump's campaign, right? If that's in the report, I don't know that to be accurate. Well, that's why Sessions recused himself. So you've confirmed today that the president dictated a message for you to give to Attorney General Sessions about what he should say about Russian contacts with the Trump campaign, correct? In general, that's accurate, yes. So you told the special counsel that the president scripted what he wants Sessions to say in a public speech as if it were Sessions' own words about his knowledge of the Russian contacts with the campaign, right? That seems to be an accurate representation. Okay. Now, that, that isn't the only time that the president tried to influence witness testimony, according to the special counsel's report. Um, White House counsel Don McGahn told the special counsel, and I think we have a slide on this, and I see you've found your copy of the Mueller report, so if you want to follow along, it's Thank volume you. two, page one, two, three. Um, the president discussed with aides whether and in what way former campaign chairman or manager, whatever he is, Manafort, might be cooperating with the special counsel's investigation, and whether Manafort knew any information that could be harmful to the president. The special counsel concluded that, and we have another quote, and again, if you want to follow along, it's volume two, page 132, evidence concerning the president's conduct toward Manafort indicates that the president intended to encourage Manafort to not cooperate with the government. Did the president ever try to discourage you from cooperating with the special counsel, Mr. Lewandowski? I can't speak to any private conversation I may or may not have had with the president other than to say I've always been told to tell the truth. Okay, so you're not going to tell us today whether or not he encouraged you not to cooperate with the special counsel. <clears throat> I've never been instructed to do anything but tell the truth. Okay. Now, Congressman Ratcliffe asked um, what you knew about the president dangling pardons to some of his employees, and you mentioned Manafort, you mentioned Gate, there's Gates, there's also Flynn and Cohen. And the president and his counsel have suggested that pardons might be forthcoming for those, those folks. Uh, one of the reasons you're here today is that the Mueller report identified you as a participant in the president's attempts to limit or shut down the Department of Justice's investigation of Russia's sweeping interference in our 2016 election. Has the president ever offered you a pardon? Again, the White House has directed not to disclose the substance of any discussions with the president or his advisors to protect executive branch confidentiality. Okay, we've seen the letters, so you're not going to answer whether or not the president has offered you a pardon. Ma'am, it's not my privilege, and I'm respecting the White House's direction. my time. Thank you. 
I, um, on the same day that you were subpoenaed to appear before this committee, August 15th, the president did indicate that he's going to support your Senate campaign, didn't he? I'm not sure. Okay. Well, I just want to know for the record that when Mr. Lewandowski um, asked for the committee to give him a little break about an hour and a half, two hours ago, he took the time during that recess to launch his Senate campaign website with a tweet. And I think that fact says an awful lot about the witness's motivation to appear here today, and I've heard enough. I yield back. <laughs> the uh, uh, gentlelady from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I, too, want to clarify for the record that um, I think earlier you said that uh, Democrats in this committee, perhaps the Democrats, I hate this president more than they love their country. That simply is not true. You're looking at someone uh, that loves her country, and more importantly, as a judge, I've taken an oath of office more than once to uphold the constitutional laws of this country. And I take this work of this committee very seriously, uh, and I would hope that, that you, as a former peace officer, would do the same uh, and show more respect to this committee and the work that we're undertaking. Uh, having said that, uh, I, Mr. Nebraska, you agree that if anyone does try to meddle with U.S. elections, they should go to jail, right? I do. I know there's, there's a clip of you saying that. Uh, we can run the clip. Now, if other people who were operating outside the realm of what their responsibilities were were trying to coordinate to materially impact the outcome of an election, and if they did that, I hope they go to jail for the rest of their lives because our democracy is too important to play with. Well, I agree with that statement, and I know that on July 27, 2016, now, if, when you were still regularly communicating with Trump candidate, Trump publicly called for Russia uh, to find missing Clinton emails by stating on July 27. Uh, Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. So, Mr. Landowski, let's be very clear. In that speech, the president was suggesting publicly to the whole world that Russia should hack Hillary Clinton's emails. And it got even worse. After his statement, Russia did hack his opponent's emails as he asked them to. And when LeakyLeaks released those emails, Mr. Trump tweeted how great it was. He said at the campaign appearances in October and November of 2016, this just came out, WikiLeaks. I love WikiLeaks. He said that in Pennsylvania in 2016, October. This WikiLeaks is like a treasure trove. He said that in uh, Minnesota in October of 2016. He had said in um, Ohio, boy, I love reading those WikiLeaks. And I believe all those quotes were also there for the whole, for you to see. So again, let's be clear. This is then Canada Trump tweeting congratulations to Russia and WikiLeaks for stealing documents from U.S. citizens. And I think, you know, if it could get worse, it did. Multiple individuals have testified under oath that Mr. Trump, in fact, knew about the release of these stolen emails prior to the release. I'm going to read you these quotes. Witnesses testified under oath that, quote, Trump privately sought information about future week releases. That's in the Mueller report. Volume 2, page 77, the slide's up there for you to see. Deputy Campaign Manager Rick Gates told the special counsel that he, quote, was with Trump on a trip to an airport, and you can't read too much of it because it's redacted, but it said, and shortly after the call ended, Trump told Gates that more releases of damaging information would be coming. He knew it. He said it'll be coming, which turned out to be true. That's in volume 2 of page 18. So if there, the screen is up, the shot is up there. So in fact, the White House redacted some of the information in the report, and you saw those redactions on the screen. So there could actually be more in those redactions. The president's personal attorney, Michael Cohen, testified to Congress this past February under oath that, quote, Mr. Trump knew from Roger Stone in advance about the WikiLeaks. And you've got the slide there uh, showing us exactly what the testimony reflects. Roger Stone has been charged with serious federal crimes for his conduct during the campaign. And his indictment, it also says that, quote, 
Stone was contacted by senior Trump campaign officials to inquire about future releases by WikiLeaks. Stone thereafter told Trump campaign about potential future releases, and that's in the, in the indictment, and I have a copy here if you wish to see it. So again, to be clear, Roger Stone has known the, year, the president for years. They've been longtime friends. Didn't you say, quote, and here's the, the screenshot from CNN, Roger Stone's history with Donald Trump goes back, he's 20 years, he's been someone who has known then Mr. Trump and worked with him through business dealings long before we ever started a political campaign. So the fact is that he stole materials, he encouraged the hacking, and don't you think that's doing what you said and no one should do, and if they do, that they should go to jail for the rest of their lives? I stand by my statement that anybody who attempted to materially impact so the agree, outcome of an election should go to jail the for the rest of their the lives. President should go to jail for doing what I just reiterated it in outline in my statement. I didn't say that, ma'am. Well, it seems to me that the, even this president needs to be held accountable because no one is above the law. And I agree with you that if someone does interfere with our elections, they should go to jail, including this president, if necessary. General lady yields back the. Yield back. The gentleman from Colorado. Mr. Lewandowski, uh, I'd like to get back to something that, uh, an exchange that you had with Mr. Cicilline and, and Mr. Jeffries. Uh, we've talked a great deal today about the message uh, that the president asked you to deliver to then Attorney General Jeff Sessions. And as you've testified today, uh, and you've uh, informed the special counsel as well during uh, the special prosecutor's investigation, you, quote, stored the notes uh, in a safe, right? And as you'll see on the slide there, quoting directly from the special counsel's report, which you described to the special counsel as the standard procedure for sensitive items. Uh, but that was your standard procedure. That is not normal protocol for official White House documents. My colleague uh, mentioned this earlier, but since you're not a White House employee and have not been, as you've testified, I'll remind you again that the White House has a legal protocol to follow for official documents. As you'll see on this next slide, uh, the, this screen is a memo from this White House, Donald Trump's White House, about the Presidential Records Act. Uh, so the President is well informed about the record requirements uh, for our Commander-in-Chief. And as you'll see on this slide, under the PRA, the White House must preserve and maintain all memos, letters, notes, emails, and written communications from the President, just like the note that he dictated to you. Uh, and of course, uh, those notes are not supposed to be kept in uh, a secret safe uh, in his former campaign manager's house. And so it's clear, I think, to folks who read Special Counsel's report that that is why the president asked you. He wanted this message to be hidden, and uh, he knew you wouldn't keep a record. Uh, in fact, you took it out of the White House after uh, Ms. Hicks typed it up uh, and stored it in your personal safe. Now, I want to give you an opportunity to, to just confirm this. In your exchange with Mr. Swalwell, uh, you talked a bit about the notes uh, that you uh, dictated from the president. And in the special counsel's report, it makes clear uh, on page 91, the second, excuse me, the last sentence of the second paragraph uh, that when you met with the president, uh, this was, quote, the first time the president had asked Lewandowski to take dictation. And Lewandowski wrote as fast as possible to make sure he captured the content correctly. That sentence cites your interview with the special counsel. In your exchange with Mr. Swalwell, uh, you contradicted that. And so it, it, I, I'm trying to figure out that discrepancy. Was this, in fact, the first time that you had uh, been asked by the president to take dictation? To be clear, the words that are written in this report are not my words. That's the representation of a summary of my conversation with the special counsel. And I can say that I have on numerous occasions been directed by the president to write specific information down and deliver that. So, to that end, Mr. Lewandowski, have you turned over those notes? Were those notes turned over to the special prosecutor? I've complied with all requirements of the special counsel. I appreciate you saying that. I'll ask the question again. Did you turn over any other notes that had been dictated to you by the president to the special prosecutor outside of this note that's referenced in the report? 
I've complied with all requirements of the special well, counsel. So the record will reflect that you won't answer that particular question. And I think that's an important one for this committee to get to the bottom to. Because ultimately, oh, what you are saying is that the special counsel's statement in this report is incorrect. And if that is the case, this committee has an obligation to ascertain the contents of those other notes that you've described. Um, I just want to go back to the message that was delivered to you by the president to tell uh, the attorney general that if he did not meet with you, you should tell him that he was fired. That's on volume, in volume two, page 93. You're aware, I believe there's a slide that will pop up here. Um, you can see it uh, in front of you. I know that you're aware that the attorney general is a cabinet level position, correct? Yes, I'm aware of that. And he is, in fact, the head of the Department of Justice. He's the chief uh, law enforcement officer in the United States. You knew that you couldn't fire the attorney general, correct? Yeah, I can't fire anybody. Yeah, and as, as you told Mr. Priebus, as the next slide attests, you told the chief of staff at that time, what can I do? I'm not an employee of the administration. I'm a nobody. So if that's the case, it again is pretty clear to anyone who reads the special counsel's report that the reason the president was delivering this message to you was so that you could scare the attorney general into complying with the directive that he had given you. He enlisted you to dictate a secret message, which you store in your personal safe at home for the attorney general, and then he tells you to tell the chief law enforcement officer of the United States that if he won't meet with you, a private citizen, that he would be fired. At the end of the day, we know it's because the president didn't want anyone investigating him. The special counsel's report certainly supports that. Uh, and I will leave the last slide as I see my time has expired. Uh, but the special counsel's uh, words speak for themselves with respect to his conclusion in this exchange. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from uh, Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewandowski, uh, I want to just pause here for just a moment. Uh, we just heard facts about a foreign government attacking our elections. We've heard that quite a bit this afternoon. And we know that's a serious crime. You even said so, and I definitely agree with you. In fact, the special counsel's investigation resulted in criminal indictments of more than a dozen defendants. That included guilty pleas and indictments of top Trump official uh, campaign officials. And these guilty pleas include multiple charges of conspiracy against the United States and lying and misre misrepresenting statements to the Department of Justice officials. But it also included indictments of criminal charges against 13 individual Russian nationals and three Russian entities, primarily for conspiracy to defraud the United States. Is that correct, Mr. Lewandowski? I believe that's what that says, yes. Thank you. Um, you agree, and you've actually said so today, that anyone, whether it's a Trump campaign official or Russian individuals and entities, anyone who attacks our elections should be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law, correct? I do agree with that. Thank you. I agree, too. So to be very clear, the special counsel uncovered serious crimes by over a dozen individuals, including Russian nationals for conspiracy against the United States. I'm a representative of Georgia, and I'm very concerned with protecting our elections. Uh, Georgia has actually actively been targeted for election interference by the Russians. Unsealed indictments from the Mueller investigation showed that Russian operatives visited websites for Cobb and Fulton counties. Both of those reside within my own district looking for vulnerabilities that they might be able to exploit. And you have said, not once, but several times, and I quote, trying to coordinate to materially impact the outcome of the election, that if they did that, I hope they go to jail for the rest of their lives because our democracy is too important to play with. Mr. Lewandowski, those are your words. You've continued to stand by that. And as I've said today earlier, I agree. Our democracy is simply too important to play with. So I'm glad that we're investigating. And I'm glad that we are holding accountable anyone who will attack our elections. And that's why Special Counsel Mueller's investigation was so vitally important. It exposed people attacking our elections in Georgia and throughout the country. And that is an issue that should never 
divide us among par partisan lines. So we have to make sure that we are protecting our 2020 elections at all costs. Every American deserves the right to vote, and we must protect that right at all costs. Because democracy is, as you have said today, too important to play with. And I will yield the balance of my time to Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman. I want to thank uh, Mr. Lewandowski for being here uh, today and answering these questions for many hours. With respect to Mr. Michael Cohen, he communicated regularly with Mr. Trump during the campaign. Is that correct? Uh, there was regular communication, yes. And I want to read from paragraph 7B of Mr. Cohen's federal indictment, which states, Cohen asked individual one about the possibility of indiv individual one traveling to Russia in connection with the Moscow project and ask a senior campaign official about potential business travel to Russia. The senior campaign official Mr. Cohen references is yourself. Is that correct? Could be. Mr. Cohen uh, testified before the House Oversight Committee on February 27th. It's on the screen in uh, front of you. Uh, he testified specifically that that senior advisor was yourself. I'll skip to the end. Uh, Mr. De Congressman Desanye asked who was the campaign official, and Mr. Cohen responded, quote, Corey Lewandowski. Now, more importantly, Mr. Cohen said to the special counsel that he discussed with candidate Trump the subject of traveling to Russia during the campaign, and that Trump, quote, indicated a willingness to travel to Russia, unquote. That's volume one, page 78. Mr. Cohen then testified before Congress that Trump was individual one. It's on the screen in front of you. Is that correct? That's what Mr. Cohen testified to. Looking at the indictment again, we can now fill in the blanks. Mr. Cohen asked individual one, candidate Trump, and a senior campaign official, you, about traveling uh, to Russia. Mr. Chair, may I uh, take my regular five minutes at this time? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. During your time as campaign manager, you communicated regularly with the president. Is that correct? With then candidate Trump, yes, sir. In fact, you said you sat next to him for, quote, thousands of hours while you were campaign uh, chairman. Uh, during your time as campaign manager, did you ever have a conversation with candidate Trump about his campaign team having contact with Russians? Not to the best of my recollection, no. The special counsel's report includes emails from George Papadopoulos. He sent, you, sent to you asking about Mr. Trump traveling to Russia. Mr. Cohen also asked you about traveling to Russia per his indictment. Carter Page emailed you about Trump speaking at an event in Russia. And in your thousands of hours speaking with the president, you never mentioned any of these people emailing you asking you about Trump traveling to Russia. Is that your testimony here today? I don't recall ever having a conversation with Mr. Trump about traveling to Russia. What about after the time that Trump was elected? Did you ever discuss with the president his knowledge of his campaign's interactions with Russians? Again, at the advice of White House counsel, I can't answer questions that would be privileged, and I respect that privilege. Uh, Mr. Lewandowski, of course, was never a White House employee. I know it's been asked before, but I'm going to ask again, Mr. Chairman. I have a parliamentary inquiry. Is this an appropriate assertion? The gentleman will state his parliamentary inquiry. Is this an appropriate assertion of privilege? This is most certainly not an appropriate assertion of privilege for the reasons I stated before. Uh, the pres uh, the, the, certainly, there's no conceivable privilege for any time period before the president was the president. To be clear, the White House apparently is directing you not to answer whether the president knew about his campaign communicating with Russia just after Russia had attacked our elections. I think the American people want to know and are frustrated today, what in fact are you hiding? In Mr. Cohen's federal indictment, it named Mr. Trump as knowing about campaign communications with Russia. Again, did you ever discuss this fact with Mr. Trump? Again, to the best of my knowledge, uh, during our campaign, I never had a conversation with Mr. Trump about any contacts with Russia. The president is named as individual one in a criminal case by his former personal attorney. You're asking us to believe that you never discussed with the president 
this fact in all of your thousands of hours of conversations? Again, Congressman, to the best of my knowledge, I don't recall ever having a conversation with candidate Trump about any interaction with Russia. Mr. Cohen's indictment also states that candidate Trump directed Mr. Cohen to make payments to certain individuals beginning in October of 2016 in order to prevent those individuals from telling negative stories about candidate Trump. During the fall of 2016, at the time of these payments, did you ever discuss with candidate Trump these payments? To the best of my knowledge, I never had a conversation about those payments. And what about after the time that Mr. Trump was elected? Did you ever have a conversation with him about those payments? The White House has directed that I not, I not disclose any conversations or the substance of those discussions with the president or his advisors to protect executive branch privilege. To be clear, you're being told that you're not allowed to answer whether the president told you that he directed his personal lawyer to make illegal payments. I'm simply going at the direction of the White House. It's not my privilege to waive, Congressman. To be clear, the White House is telling you not to answer whether you discussed potential crimes with the President of the United States. Mr. Lewandowski, it's clear to me that the President... The gentleman, yield for a moment. Please. I believe the uh, Nixon case is, uh, established the very ironclad principle that uh, discussions regarding criminal acts are not privileged. So there's no possibility of a privilege with respect to the question of whether you were asked uh, about criminal activities. I yield. Mr. Lewandowski, it's clear to me that the president, the campaign, and yourself did not want the American people to know about any campaign contact with Russia. You lied to cover it up. You lied when you publicly said you knew, quote, nothing about Russia. Multiple senior campaign members were regularly communicating with you about traveling to Russia, meeting with Russians, and even Mr. Trump possibly going to Russia. There's documentation that contradicts your denials, including emails with you personally. This committee, our committee, will not let anyone, not the President of the United States, not anyone, to hide the truth of the American people any longer. No one is above the law. I yield back. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. The, ge gentleman, the gentleman yields back. The gentleman will state his point of order. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, the, the refusal by Mr. Lewandowski to answer the questions about whether he had discussions with the president about payments from personal lawyer uh, to those payments from the personal lawyer or whether he had discussions with the president about knowledge of the campaign's interactions with Russia are not protected. And I would ask, as the chairman reconsiders whether to hold Mr. Lewandowski in contempt as he goes forward from this hearing, it's important to note that the White House directed Mr. Lewandowski not to discuss the substance of conversations about official government matters. The White House counsel is here. If the chairman would like to ask them whether they assert that those discussions about Russia or personal payments are official government business, they can be asked. Otherwise, certainly as you consider and you weigh whether to hold Mr. Lewandowski in yeah, contempt, it is you should consider those. I, I, it, it is certainly the case, I'm not going to ask White House counsel, it is certainly the case that conversations about criminal actions are not official White House business, without question. And I will give Mr. Lewandowski, in light of uh, this ruling, the opportunity to answer that question again. Mr. Chairman. While he's, while he's doing that, we can, I, I have a parliamentary inquiry. Gentlemen, please. Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I'm not an attorney, and I had to continue at the advice of White House counsel, and you're welcome to take this matter up with them, but I've drawn the line of having private conversations with the President of the United States during the transition or his time as president. So I have been very candid and open about answering all questions about the campaign, and I will continue to do so. But at the direction of the council, they have exerted an executive privilege of which is not mine to waive. I will, I, will, I will then simply observe on the record that the White House has uh, claimed a privilege for, with respect to the question of possible criminal activity or instructions for criminal activity by the by the President of the United States. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman will state his parliamentary in, inquiry. In, li in, in light of the discussion just now and the, and the gentleman's from Florida's long question, was there ever a doubt 